We will have a chance for questions at the end of each panel session. And if you have questions during any of the presentations, please feel free to use the Q&A option for this purpose. If you have the need for closed captioning, you can access this through the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your toolbar. Now for the program today, I just want to give a short sort of uh, context for why we have decided to host this symposia and the topic that we have chosen. So the 1981 floor sculpture, Quantock Wood Circle by the British artist Richard Long is currently on view at the Yale Centre for British Art, where it will remain so through to February the 19th, 2023. The piece consists of 285 weathered and broken pine branches that the artist collected from the Quantock Hills in Somerset, near his hometown of Bristol in England. The sculpture brings materials that were collected while walking in the countryside into the museum space, thereby activating the floor and raising questions about our relationship with space, with place and with nature. Taking Long's work as a provocation, today's symposium explores how artists from around the world have exploited the floor to interrogate ideas of embodied viewership, identity, land and modern sculpture. In doing so, the event aims to offer new frameworks for understanding the conceptual decision to place works on the floor. Today's symposium consists of three panels and closes with a keynote conversation piece. From 9am until 10.30, we have panel one entitled The Body and the Floor. This panel is chaired by Joanna Fiducia, who is Assistant Professor in the History of Art here at Yale, where she specialises in European and North American modern art. Her scholarship and art criticism have been published in Art History, October, Parquet, East of Borneo and Art Forum. Her current book project is titled Figures of Crisis, Alberto Giacometti and the Myths of Nationalism. From 10.45 until 12.15 p.m. we have panel two entitled Land, City and the Planet. This panel is chaired by Alexis Lowry, who is a curator at Dia Art Foundation New York, where she's responsible for exhibitions, commissions, collection presentations and public programs across Dia's sites. From 1 p.m. until 2.30, we have panel three entitled Sculptural Dialogues, which is chaired by Malene Theodore, who is the Associate Curator of Programs here at the Yale University Art Gallery, where she develops and oversees public programs. The day will conclude with a conversation piece from 3 to 4 p.m. between the artist Carla Black and Rachel Stratton, Curatorial Postdoc Associate here at the museum. There are scheduled breaks throughout the day, which we will announce as we come to them. And there is also a full time schedule available on our website if you wish to follow there. And it is now my pleasure to hand over to Joanna to introduce the first session. Thank you all. Just waiting a moment while my video turns on, my apologies. Well, in its absence, uh, let me get started. Thank you, Gemma, for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be part of this um, of this symposium and a delight to introduce our three panelists who I'll introduce in a row. Um, as was noted, the chat function is disabled for those who are here as participants, but please feel welcome to put a question into the Q&A function at any point. All right. Um, our first speaker this morning is Pepe Carmel. Pepe Carmel is a professor in the Department of Art History at New York University. He is the author of Picasso and the Invention of Cubism and Abstract Art, A Global History. His next book will be Picasso Metamorphoses, which will be published by Thames and Hudson in 2023. He is currently working on a book about global contemporary art. Carmel has contributed to numerous exhibition catalogs and written widely on modern and contemporary art for publications including the New York Times, Art in America, and the Brooklyn Rail. He assisted William Rubin in the organization of Picasso and Brock, pioneering Cubism at MoMA in 1989, and was co-curator with Kirk Varnado of Jackson Pollock, also at MoMA in 1998. As a solo curator, he organized Robert Morris, Felt Work at the Gray Art Gallery in 1989, Dialogues with Picasso at the Musée Picasso Malaga in 2020 to 2023, and other exhibitions. 
Our second speaker this evening, this morning, excuse me, will be Shruti Parthasarati, an art who is an art historian, writer, editor, and literary translator with a special emphasis on South Asian art, particularly its contested modernities. She is the editor of KB Goal Critical Writings on Art, 1957 to 1998, uh, and her lead essay on the avant-garde 1960s art collective titled Group 1890, The Journey of a Moment for the exhibition Group 1890, India's Indigenous Modernism was hailed as original, uh, significant contribution to art historical scholarship. Her monograph on the Indian abstract painter, the late Ram Kumar is forthcoming from DAG New Delhi in 2023. She is also a literary translator with her English translation of Mihir Pandya's Hindi cinema via Delhi, forthcoming from HarperCollins, India, and a three volume translation of writings by the painter writer Ram Kumar currently in progress. She is pursuing a doctoral degree in art history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our final speaker this morning will be Michael Timkew, who is senior lecturer in art history at the University of Essex, where he began working in 2015 after a postdoctoral fellowship at the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence Max Planck Institute. He received his PhD and MBA from the University of Chicago and his BA from Yale University. Michael's research largely focuses on issues of spectatorship in modern and contemporary art and visual culture. His writings include Nazi exhibition design and modernism, the recently completed book manuscript, Walking on Art, 1950s to Now, which is currently under review, and various articles in journals such as The Art Bulletin, Art History, Journal of Design History, Leonardo, and Word and Image. Thank you very much, and please welcome our first speaker. Hi there, good morning, it's Pepe Carmel. Um, I can't see anybody, so I'm not sure if you can see me. Um, and let's see if it's possible to bring up the PowerPoint. Um, oh, okay, that seems to be working. Good, okay, so we've got art if not people. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to start by thanking Rachel Stratton, Jennifer Ongley and the staff of the Yale Center for British Art for the invitation to speak today and for organizing this conference, which promises to be tremendously interesting. Um, so a lot of ground to cover. Let me get started. Um, going back to the 60s, uh, when we start seeing works on the floor, uh, the, the early examples of this genre uh, address a set of issues that you might call phenomenological. So that the traditional aesthetics of sculptural composition and so forth get replaced by a, an idea that the work of art intervenes in the viewing situation. As Robert Morris said in his famous essay, Notes on Sculpture, minimal sculpture, quote, took relationships out of the work and made them into a function of space, light, and the viewer's field of vision. Uh, I'm showing you here on the left, one of Morris's constructions or installations of this era, the L beams, um, as Rosalind Krauss remarked in a key essay about them, uh, they are literally identical, three identical constructions, but they seem different because of their different relationships to the floor. One of them, the one in the foreground is completely recumbent, both ends of the L are lying on the floor, one of them, the, the, the one at the upper left, feels arched. You can tell that it's under tension, that gravity is trying to push it down, but it's resisting. And the one at the upper right, which is standing up, it's very, there's this strong contrast between the vertical upright part and the <clears throat> horizontal part, which is resting on the floor. Uh, Richard Serra's one-ton prop, House of Cards, which you see on the right, has a less obvious relationship to the floor, although it necessarily sits on the floor. Uh, what, what's, it belongs to a series known as the prop pieces in which all involve a tension between the downward pull of gravity and the friction of material on material, typically lead plates on lead, either a plate or a roll of lead. Uh, House of Cards, the best known example of this series, seems especially fragile. I mean, it seems frankly like an allegory of somebody on the verge of a nervous breakdown. 
And it's essential that this piece is on the floor uh, because it heightens the viewer's awareness that the work exists under the same conditions, under the force of gravity in the same way as the viewers themselves who are standing on the floor looking at it. Of course, the irony with Sarah's piece is that because these plates are tremendously heavy, typically it has to be displayed with some kind of barrier around it because if someone did knock into it and the plates fell down, you know, somebody's foot could get crushed by it. So there's you know, a, a possibility of a very dangerous interaction between viewer and artwork. So I want to go from these to the artist who's the, the starting point for today's uh, symposium, Richard Long, and uh, trace his evolution towards the idea of work on the floor. It's, it's useful to remember that Long doesn't start out as a maker of installations, but rather as a kind of conceptual performance artist who would take walks across the English countryside or elsewhere. And then these were presented in the gallery by maps and lines uh, tracing his trajectory. It's, it's hard to see in the reproduction on the left of a, a 10 mile walk in England from 1968. Uh, there's a straight line, which you can probably see on your screens, that marks his intended path. You know, he's going from point A to point B as the crow flies. But of course, in a real landscape, this is impossible. And below that, there's a kind of curvy, irregular path that shows you where he actually walked. Now, he goes from there to making walk to taking walks in much more exotic places, as recorded in the photograph on the right, Circle in the Andes. And at some point, in this series of performances, it seems to have occurred to him that you know he needed to do something to mark his presence there in these places. You know, after all, the map piece on the left could have been done without ever leaving his studio. How do we know he actually took that walk in England? Um, so he would make these constructions. He would gather up raw materials from the ground wherever he was and put them into circles. I, I think perhaps sometimes also squares, but what I mostly remember are circles to do something that's obviously artificial, that's man-made and marks a human presence, in this case, his human presence in this landscape. And so it's a kind of proof of his having moved through that landscape. But note that the emphasis at this point in 1972 is still on uh, his movement through the landscape. The, the creation of what you know one is tempted to call a sculpture is a kind of byproduct or adjunct to the, the actual performance. Now, within a few years, he had shifted gears and began bringing the materials from nature into the gallery, into the studio, into the gallery gallery, into the museum gallery, as the, in the work on the left, Stone Circle, 1976, and these have become really his trademark pieces. And Quantock Wood Circle, which you see on the right, as, as we saw in the sort of splash page for this conference, and I, I just love, I've got to say, just love the juxtaposition of these sticks and pieces of branches with the, the gorgeous walls of the Yale Center for British Art and the wonderful paintings on them, which are so different in their apparent appearance, you know, in, in the aesthetic of painting, and yet all together very much part of the same British sensibility, the engagement with the landscape. I'm a whole nother lecture there about you know, the British and landscape. Um, in any case, even here in the gallery, we are no longer dealing with that or not so much dealing with that phenomenological relationship to the floor that I was pointing out a moment ago in Robert Morris and Richard Serra Instead, we are dealing with the floor of the gallery, in this case, a wooden floor on the right, as a kind of surrogate for the ground, for the nature where Long would take his walks, where he would gather up the pieces of wood. So I want to mark here critically or philosophically, if that's not too pretentious, a shift in, in category from the phenomenological to the symbolic, that the floor is no longer simply a site for human presence, but as rather a source of symbolism. And this shift is something we see in other works from the 1970s. For instance, you might compare Long Circle in the Andes, which we looked at a moment ago, to Anna Mendieta's Silhouetta series. Uh, I picked one of the most dramatic uh, examples from it, where in, in all of this series, she digs trenches into the earth uh, 
in the shape of a human body, something that suggests not just any human body, but a woman's body, and by, by implication, her own body, that she is placing herself in the earth with you know, very dramatic and, in her case, tragic associations, and all the more so here because she's poured red dye into part of the trench. So here, the earth itself is um, assuming a very symbolic, powerful symbolic meaning. Now, in the context of the 1970s, specifically a feminist art of the 70s, there was a, an association that she and many other women artists made between woman as a category and nature as a category. For some artists, for some critics, this was a very powerful statement of self-assertion. Other critics saw this as a kind of regressive move that isn't a typical patriarchal culture to identify women as nature and dissociate them from culture, which is presumed to be a masculine realm. So once again, that could be a whole nother lecture. But my point for today is really simply that here in Mendieta's work, as in Long's work, the earth has become a symbolic element. It is not, it, it is in this case, evoking nature. It is no longer just a plane, a stage for phenomenological action. The situation gets um, even more complex or, or you know, adds new elements in 1989 when uh, Jean-Hubert Martin organizes his uh, epochal exhibition, Magician de la Terre, Magicians of the Earth, really the first major show of global art, global contemporary art. Uh, this is at uh, the Pompidou in several Parisian spaces. Um, and here, Martin invited Long to install a piece that was not on the floor, rather it's a mud circle or red earth circle, but effectively some kind of mud that's on the wall rather than the floor. So more like a traditional painting, but still through the use of mud, symbolically asserts its identification with the ground, with the horizontal plane. And you know, here's a paradox that could be traced back, say, to the work of Jackson Pollock, Morris Lewis, all those artists of the 50, 40s, 50s, 60s who worked by pouring paint onto flat canvases and then translated them to the vertical planes. Should we regard them as vertical works or horizontal works? Again, another lecture. Uh, in Martin's exhibition, Long's work was paired with the work by uh, a number of artists uh, from Papunya, Australia. I'm just going to cite the first named of this group, Paddy Japaljari Sims. Um, and these indigenous artists who had only recently you know, emerged onto the world art scene. It's only around 1974 that their work begins to get uh, first national and then international attention. Um, they are drawing on um, their own traditions. And the work on the floor, like other works from this group of artists, retraces a sacred diagram. These are modified recreations of sacred diagrams that were originally simply traced on the ground using organic pigments. And they are in effect abstract maps, like much like the map of Long's hike across the countryside, except that in this case, the map records the voyages of gods and men across the Australian landscape in the first days of creation. So Whereas the Papunya artist work was typically done with acrylic on canvas or on board and displayed as conventional paintings, Martin gave them the opportunity to return to the sources of their own work and to work on the floor here. But despite this horizontal orientation, it is very much a representation. It is a, it is a map. It is a image of a journey and so forth. Now, moving deeper into the 80s and the 90s, I wanted to bring up the work of two more artists, Wolfgang Leib, the German artist, and Christian Boltanski from France, who both often, mostly, well, mostly in the work of Leib, often in the work of Boltanski, <clears throat> work by making installations that are on the floor, where that placement is critical to the significance of their work. In, in Leib's case, this particular installation, the rice meals, uh, recalls the Hindu custom of making offerings to the gods um, by giving them meals of rice. 
And the humility of this gesture of making an offering is underscored by placing the rice bowls on the floor. In this case, they're on the floor of a, a Christian uh, cathedral. So there's you know complex sort of syncretic myth a mix of religious traditions happening here, which gets us into the problem of the idea of the sacred as a universal category. And one might, again, another lecture question the validity of the idea of the sacred. Um, it, does it actually mean anything or does it just mush together a lot of traditions? Um, in Holy Week, Boltanski's imagery is, I think, more specifically focused on uh, Catholicism. This is, you know, a regular holiday in the Catholic calendar, uh, but he evokes it by taking used overcoats and placing them on the floor in a long band that is running down the nave of Saint Eustache, a, a late Gothic church near the heart of Paris. There's a kind of symbolism to the color of the coats. If you look carefully, you'll see the, some of them are red, white, and blue, the colors of the French flag. Others are black, white, and gray. The coats, in effect, seem to be prostrate as if, you know, there had been people in them a moment ago. They're prostrate on the floor. The people are heading towards the altar, almost as if they were crawling across the floor towards the altar. And if, you know, we had time to dig into the history of Catholicism, there is, I mean, confusingly, I think more in English rather than the French tradition of actually um, this making this kind of prostration or mo movement towards the altar during Holy Week. But here, the floor itself serves as a, perhaps not exactly as a kind of altar, but as a extension of the altar. Now, of, of course, in, as always in Boltanski's work, if the placement of the coats evokes traditional Catholic rites, their accumulation evokes a different set of questions. Who were the coats' original owners? Why were they abandoned? They end up evoking the Holocaust, as, as so much of Boltanski's work does, and the Nazi practice of stripping victims of clothing and other possessions before sending them to the gas chambers, so that the floor here also acquires a kind of deathly mortal symbolism. We are reminded that the ground is also where people are buried. It's associated with death. Now, uh, with, in the 90s, we also encounter the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres. And uh, here I want to make a comparison to uh, a work by Robert Morris circling around to where we started, uh, his corner piece from Morris's corner piece from 1964. Uh, when Morris had one of his first retrospectives in 1969, uh, Annette Michelson, in an essay called Robert Morris and Aesthetics of Transgression, described Morris's plywood construction as willfully violating the corner. So already the phenomenological interpretation, which Morris himself and Morris via Rosalind Krauss, the two were you know, interlocutors in the 60s and the 70s, um, is replaced by this, you know, weird, aggressive, and, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, frankly, you know, tasteless and almost offensive comparison of, you know, the, the sculpture raping the corner. Um, so, you know, something very strange is going on in the interpretation, whether you see it is going on in the piece is another, in the actual work is another question. Um, Gonzalez Torres's non-rigid pile of candies, you know, completely abandons this rape metaphor. If ever, you know, if it was really there in the Morris to begin with, instead the the, the pile or spill, as it's often called, the, the spill of candies become relics of his lost partner Ross, who had died of AIDS. Again, a whole lecture on different modes of art made in response to the AIDS epidemic. Uh, so, as you know, the visitor to works like this is invited to consume one of, to take the candies and consume them so that the visitor gets to participate in the sweetness of the love that these two people shared. Also, it also makes possible a kind of communion between the artist and the visitor. Here, then, the floor, as in, say, Wolfgang Leib's work, becomes a kind of altar. It's a altar on which you might say communion wafers are set out for the faithful to partake. However, the, this floor orientation can also go, uh, you know, picking up on an earlier theme in a more violent and tragic uh, direction, as in the more contemporary work of Teresa Margoles from Mexico. This is a, a installation performance uh, from 2009, which is called Limpieza or Cleaning, 
which seems to show a man mopping a floor. You would think he is cleaning it, except that in this case, Margolis, who is very who is concerned much of her work with criminal violence, the drug lords, et cetera, in, Mex in the north of Mexico, um, had gone to morgues where there were the bodies of people who had been mur murdered in drug warfare and washed the blood off their bodies and then collected that blood-stained water. And what the man in this photograph is actually doing is mopping the floor with blood-stained water. He's not cleaning it, he's spreading blood across it. So we are back once again to the floor as a kind of altar, um, not a scene of peace, but a scene of, of sacrifice and a, a larger metaphor here of Mexico as a the, the country itself as a sacrificial altar with a kind of crucifixion on the, the agony of the drug trade. And then finally, picking up on this theme, uh, I wanted to show you the work of a Pakistani artist, Imran Qureshi, who is best known for small-scale uh, manuscript-style paintings. He's part of a larger movement, which you could call neo-manuscript painting, which was to some extent, to a very large extent, initiated by Shazia Sikander in the 1990s. Um, and is carried on today by her, by Shapur Poyan and Shiva Ahmadi from Iran. Qureshi is one of the great Pakistani practitioners of this, uh, but he also works in an installation mode. And uh, what he's done here is to take a courtyard and to paint the floor and the steps with thousands of red flowers. From a distance, however, they look like bloodstains. They look as if it could have been a terrorist attack. And as you know, tragically, such attacks are a frequent occurrence in Pakistan. There's a great deal of, um, in, you know, sec uh, that's not the word I want, sectarian warfare of different groups attacking one another, different religious groups attacking one another in Pakistan, so that the ground here once again assumes the meaning of a site of death, a site of burial, a site of suffering. Uh, close up, if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see the flowers and yet the dripping paint still evokes the sense of blood. So there's a, a contradiction embedded in the work itself, which is, is tragic, you know, simultaneously beautiful and horrifying. So to conclude, if, if you can classify um. all of these works, starting with Morris as post-minimal, I would say that post-minimalism permits artists to unlock the symbolic potential of the everyday environment, whether it's artificial or whether it's a natural environment, and it makes the floor into a powerful expressive element in art. Thank you. Joanna, should I begin? Yes, please begin. You can start sharing uh, your screen. My apologies, I wasn't sure. Um, Good morning, everyone. Um, I am um, speaking today on an Indian uh, contemporary uh, performance artist called Romana Hussain, who uh, lived from 1952 to 1999, um, often known as India's first performance artist. And I'm really glad for um, Professor Kamal's uh, lecture uh, piece presentation first because he wonderfully contextualized the, the, the emergence of the use of floor in, in Western art. Uh, my work is going to slightly uh, move away and in fact, actually in some ways connect with the, the, more, the, the later works that Professor Kamal showed. Um, Romana Hussain um, uh, was an easel painter uh, up until the late early late 80s um, when the big uh, event that happened um, uh, in India was um, that caused a distinct polarization between Hindus and Muslims was the destruction of the Babri Masjid, which was a, an act of uh, wanton vandalism carried out by majority Hindu forces. And it led to nationwide riots. And um, it was an event that completely shocked uh, nearly everyone in India. As I said, led was a watershed moment, led, led to a before and after sort of moment for Indian Muslims. Uh, many artists responded to this event, um, and for Romana Hussain in particular, as a woman and a Muslim, uh, but who had been an elite Muslim and who had sort of been untouched by the uh, any kind of a religious identity until now, uh, was deeply shocked by this, and it really dramatically shifted her practice 
to um, to one that fronted her body, that moved into installation and performance art. Uh, these are some of the first works that she created in 93. Um, as I said, she was working earlier. She was in easel-based practice. Uh, she had an easel-based practice. And uh, in these early works, she moves now to using um, material like terracotta and earth pigments um, like geru, which is the red ochre powder, um, also rice, cowrie shells. But she, in the beginning, still worked with paper, created a number of works as this here um, on the yoni or the uh, vagina, um, and then creates begins to create works which, is, which are referring to a certain femininity, a certain feminist praxis, but distinctly uh, imagery of the womb and fertility uh, with these terracotta pots and urns as wombs, but also, um, uh, but also the imagery distinctly being one of breakage, and rupture, and and this womb under attack. The first works uh, were on paper or wall mounted, like this work, um, and then she creates. She begins to place things on pedestals, which are relatively still high. Uh, as the work here, dissected projections, which is working now with both projection mirroring, this uh, with, with terracotta shards, broken shards that are placed on a mirror, and a full semicircle itself on the wall. So there's still the vertical upward and downward movement uh, as the artist, as the viewer takes in the work. And soon enough, she moves to work like this uh, resonance, where she places on plates rice, cowrie shell, water. On a bed, on a mirror, which is placed low on the floor, um, and there's a cowrie shell painted on the uh, on paper, which is on the wall still, um, and there is this sort of interaction and inter uh, and even a dialectic between the floor and what is and as the artist viewer sorry takes in what's on the wall. Um, in works that she moved to soon after is where we see the dramatic change in her work, where now uh, these pots are broken. Uh, they're often sliced in half or hollowed as here and from which rich red earth spills. A clear metaphor for, for violence, for blood, for spillage. Um, and she also created a few works, a very small number as this. This is the only work that I have personally not seen called Sequence and Change where she's placing a bicycle without pedals that's on the floor where there's a mirror which reflects the bicycle um, and placed on a strip of sand. Uh, these works led Rumana to her first, uh, my apologies, that's, that work is from 1995, no, 97, Living on the Margin. It was her first performance art work uh, performed in Bombay at the National Center for Performing Arts. And Rumana placed on the floor bricks. Uh, she used red, uh, she, she used um, blue detergent powder to mimic indigo uh, in a continuation of using earth pigments. And she walked around with a half cut papaya filled with seeds, uh, in a, a, her mouth open in a silent howl. She uses this space to almost ritual like, where she first places uh, lamps on the floor, lights them around the papaya, and then she picks them up and walks around it, stepping on the indigo and marking the entire path with her indigo stained feet. In 1996, uh, Hussein created this work. It's a multi-part installation in a room called Home or Nation or Home Nation, where she brought disparate elements to conflate the identities of home and nation and also place them in juxtaposition, in opposition. The, uh, the work was still coming out of her response to the Babri Masjid. Um, so on one side, on top, this is one part of what the room looked like. And these this is the... Uh, strip of photographs of hollows. The idea that she begins with the papaya, uh, that imagery continues where she uses the hollow of the mouth, ar um, old Islamic architectural doorways, arches, uh, the papaya, the human mouth, the female open mouth, uh, as again, these hollows, um, very sexualized imagery, uh, but also trying to just speak of the idea of these concave uh, spaces which were placed in opposition to these as in on the other side of the room were these photographs of uh, 
old architectural uh, landmarks in the city of Ayodhya where Babri Masjid was and where it was destroyed. Uh, these point their, their presence uh, gestures to the mixed and syncretic Hindu-Muslim culture that had been there. These are medieval buildings. But the photographs are brought close to the ground, placed on bricks, and the and she deliberately uses simple material like planks on which to mount the photos. Uh, these both elongate the photographs and create a connection with the earth. Uh, Hi, everyone. I am just going to pull up my slides. Um, share screen. Okay. Before I for, uh, begin, I would like to thank Rachel Stratton, Jen Ongley, and their colleagues at the Yale Center for British Art for putting together this symposium, which is about a, a subject I've been thinking way too much about uh, for the last eight years or so. So it's great to uh, know that other people are thinking about it. And um, I'm looking forward to the continued learning about um, other artists' uh, works and, and the, the floor stakes. Um, Let's dive right in. The Colombian artist Dora Salcedo has dedicated herself to making works that mourn victims of political violence, a project she describes as a topology of mourning. Given that the term topology carries associations with place and memory, the ground outside, a site widely used for burying and honoring the dead, has unsurprisingly played a role in Salcedo's topology of mourning. Yet just as important is the ground indoors, or what one typically calls a floor. Uh, uh, where are we? Um, as the artist has remarked, quote, the floor in my work is a constant. To me, that relationship interests me greatly, that act of looking down, which seems to humanize us because, because we tend not to look, to forget what is there, end quote. As part of drawing attention to what gets overlooked or forgotten, Salcedo has created several works that are either, either embedded into the floor or laid flat just above this surface to function as floors in their own right. Consistent with the artist's remarks about the humanizing potential of looking down, such works certainly attract a spectator's gaze downward. However, these works also elicit a range of embodied experiences that extend beyond vision and for most spectators, hinge on ambulation. In my talk today, I'll consider the role of ambulation in three floor-based works by Salcedo. As I argue, ambulation and the wider array of kinesthetic experiences associated with walking contribute to fostering a sense of quote-unquote empathic unsettlement among spectators, to borrow a term from historian Dominic Lecapra. This occurred partly by forging a performative, affective connection with individuals who have been subjected to different forms of political violence, and partly by unsettling spectators so they do not collapse their own subject position with that of individuals who have endured such violence. Through such empathic unsettlement, ambulation has provided a catalyst for audiences to critically reflect on a spectator's own role in altering forms of behavior and thinking that make such violence possible. While Salcedo has created several floor-based works for which ambulation has assumed a decisive role, among the earliest examples, uh, major examples, is Shibboleth. Commissioned by London's Tate Modern, this work featured a long and meandering crack in the museum's immense turbine hall. In line with the emphasis on difference and exclusion in the work's title, which describes a word or sound used for detecting outsiders based on their pronunciation, Shibboleth's crack in the floor alluded to what Salcedo quote, called the quote, hole in history that marks the bottomless difference separating whites from non-whites, and in so doing evoked the history of racism that runs parallel to the history of modernity, its untold dark side, end quote. Shibboleth gave visual and spatial form to this quote, unquote, untold dark side of modernity in several ways. One involved creating what Salcedo described as an out of control intrusion into a rationalist building, disturbing the turbine hall, quote, in the same way as the appearance of immigrants disturbs the consensus and homogeneity of European societies, end quote. Additionally, 
Rather than simply cracking open the hall's floor, Salcedo placed Colombian rock face into what she called the floor's newly opened negative space, a choice of materials that highlighted geographic displacement and difference. Indeed, even as spectators were unaware of its origins, the rock face was covered with wire mesh, a material that exemplified difference and exclusion since it constitutes among the quote, most common means of control used to define borders and divisions, end quote, as noted in the museum's press release. Salcedo's decision to crack open an exhibition space's floor was not without precedent, with perhaps the most significant being Germania, for which Hans Hacke ripped up the Nazi era floor of the German pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 1993. However, by eliciting a form of quote unquote empathic and settlement among spectators. By this, I mean that Shibboleth invited multiple forms of tactile contact that encouraged spectators to feel into the work's negative space, to loosely build on the original German term for empathy, Einfühlung. Such tactile contact arose above all through a spectator's feet. For example, when visitors stepped into the artwork's negative space, balanced their feet across the crack, or placed their feet along the work's interior surfaces. In some cases, spectators also sat or crouched on the floor to run their fingers, and sometimes feet, along the surfaces of the work's negative space, underscoring how the work elicited tactile contact with, through both their feet and hands. Through such tactile contact, Shibboleth fostered a qualified connection between audiences and what Salcedo has called the, quote, huge socially excluded underclass that lives on the edges and the borders of life, end quote, an underclass to which the work alluded through the insertion of Colombian rock face into the cracked floor. At the same time, Shibboleth created a highly unsettling experience for spectators um, feeling into the work's negative space. This occurred, for instance, because the irregularity of the work's interior surfaces and its considerable variances in width and depth heightened the likelihood that spectators would lose their balance when stepping near, on, or into the crack, which happened with some frequency. A more affective form of unsettled unsettlement also occurred because spectators walked on a floor that was smooth, largely horizontal, and relatively light in color whereas Shibboleth's interior was unevenly textured and in some sections looked like a darkened abyss, features that conjured a space inhabited by those who not only remain invisible, but also continually risk being brushed aside or crushed by a spectator's ill-placed feet or hands. Through this push and pull of empathic unsettlement, Shibboleth precluded a quote-unquote crude or facile form of empathy that entirely collapsed the spectator's own subject position with that of individuals who have experienced violence or other forms of injustices within the history of racism. However, whereas Le Capra's conception of empathic and settlement turns on a clear distinction between victim and perpetrator, Shibboleth encouraged audiences to occupy a more ambivalent position somewhat akin to what memory studies scholar Michael Rothberg terms implicated subjects. As Rothberg argues, by quote, occupying positions aligned with power and privilege without being themselves direct art agents of harm, implicated subjects contribute to, inhabit, inherit, or benefit from regimes of domination, even when they do not originate or control such regimes, end quote. At the same time, because anecdotal evidence suggests that so many spectators failed to grasp the work's meaning and seemed to treat the work as little more than a lighthearted form of entertainment, the act of walking on, around, or occasionally even into this work's negative space also carried the danger that audiences would overlook the larger stakes of their own roles as uh, subjects implicated in the history of racism, both within the museum and beyond. A decade after Shibboleth and following several years of research, Salcedo debuted another major floor-based work entitled Palimpsest. Commissioned by uh, Madrid's uh, Reña Sofia Museum, where the work appeared before traveling to London's White Cube Gallery um, roughly a half year later, Palimpsest featured the names on the ground of those who had drowned over the last two decades in the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea while trying to reach Europe from Africa or the Middle East. 
generally to escape civil war, other forms of political instability, or extreme economic devastation. To mourn these deaths, the names of migrants who had uh, died before 2010 were inscribed in the artwork's floor slabs, whereas the names of those who had perished between 2011 and 2016 emerged slowly and temporarily in water droplets thanks to a complex concealed hydraulic system. In this respect, the names constantly overlaid and replaced one another like a palimpsest. Palimpsest was, of course, hardly the only work of memorial art to have displayed names on the ground as a form of commemoration. But one notable example is German artist Gunter Demnig's uh, series of Stolpersteine, or stumbling blocks, each of which features brief biographical details about an individual persecuted under National Socialism. However, unlike the Stolpersteine and the longer tradition of ledger stones, Palimpsest did not involve spectators in walking directly on the names of the dead. Instead, Palimpsest invited audience, audiences to walk around the names, which effectively constituted a gesture of respect. That said, this gesture of respect remained a highly precarious one. For as cultural historian and literary scholar Andreas Hoysen has written, the names are, quote, always in danger of being trampled on by the careless visitor, end quote. By placing spectators in a position of constantly endangering the names near their feet, Palimpsest elicited a form of empathic unsettlement. In this case, an unsettling experience of potentially doing harm that, however performative and confined to the aesthetic sphere, encouraged audiences to, quote, reacquire some of the humanity we lose each time we witness the sinking of a migrant ship, end quote, to borrow Salcedo's words. Additionally, because audiences encounter palimpsest on solid ground and did so in the rather rarefied spaces of Madrid's Reña Sofia and London's White Cube, both of which might be said to represent Europe's cultural center, a spectator's own mobility and the potential harm it would inflict became a foil for the mobility injustice that had prevented the named migrants from reaching this continent by water. In these ways, one might say that the act of stepping or otherwise moving near the fragile names highlighted a spectator's role as an implicated subject, a conceptual category that cuts across the categories of victim, perpetrator, and even bystander to provide what Rothberg calls a, quote, broader conception of what it means to participate in and be responsible for injustices, end quote. Understood from this perspective, Palimpsest had the potential to provoke questions among audiences about how their own actions, however small and seemingly incidental, have contributed to the widespread indifference that Europe has shown to migrants. In 2018, Salcedo realized what many consider her most emotionally powerful floor-based work. Titled Fragmentos, or Fragments, this work consists of roughly 1,300 1300 metal plates that together form a floor on which spectators walk. These plates were produced by melting down 37 tons of weapons handed over by the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, a guerrilla group that in 2016 signed a, a peace accord with the Colombian government to end a half century long conflict that had resulted in 7 million internally displaced people over 350,000 dead civilians, and around 26,000 quote-unquote enforced disappearances. Housed in a purpose-built building in Bogota, intended to remain standing for 52 years, the same duration as the Civil War, the artwork's lead gray plates feature numerous creases, indentations, hammer marks, and even a few punctures and tears all traces of the process by which the melted down weapons were transformed into squares. As part of this process, Salcedo invited women who had endured sexual violence during the conflict to hammer sheets of aluminum, which became the basis for molds into which an admixture of steel and the melted down weapons was poured to produce the plates covering the floor. For Salcedo, horizontality was essential to Fragmentos. As she elaborated, quote, the main thing is that it is a horizontal work. It is not a vertical piece. It is not an obelisk. As a female sculptor, the last thing I plan to do is an obelisk or a triumphal arch. Because I am also not a warrior, I do not believe that war allows us to win. 
We all lost the war and we are all war survivors, end quote. In itself, Salcedo's stated emphasis on horizontality did not require her to create a work that spectators could step on. However, the work's quote unquote walkability did play a key role in upsetting the power dynamics associated with armed violence, consistent with her larger goal of refusing to celebrate war. As Salcedo put it, quote, the power that a man holds in a gun gets reversed and turned upside down when we all stand on these weapons, end quote. Much like earlier floor-based works by Salcedo, Fragmento strongly engages a spectator's sense of pedestrian touch, to borrow a term used by social anthropologist Tim Ingold and others. What remains distinct about the mode of pedestrian touch elicited by Fragmentos, however, is that the work causes spectators to have sustained an inescapable tactile contact with three groups of individuals who themselves once touched the same materials albeit in a different state. These include FARC rebels who handled their guns before giving them up as part of the peace process, members of the Colombian army who guarded the weapons and oversaw the melting process in army foundries, and survivors of sexual violence who, as already noted, participated in hammering sheets upon which the final squares were based. In these ways, the act of walking on fragmentos helped to articulate the rather unsettling connections between a spectator and what Rothberg calls complexly implicated subjects, or individuals who find themselves, quote, with lines of direct or indirect connection to histories of both victimization and perpetration, end quote. It does so vertically between a generally upright spectator and the three groups who had once touched the materials underfoot, it also does so horizontally across these groups involved in transforming guns into a floor-based counter monument to invoke a term often used by Salcedo to describe this work. In conclusion, all three floor-based works described in my talk today certainly beckon audiences to look down at the floor and in so doing, cast attention to what gets overlooked or forgotten to return to Salcedo's words. However, such works also make ambulation central to the empathic unsettlement that they el elicit as most spectators look down. To my mind, the widespread importance of ambulation to a spectator's experiences of such work seems relevant to the symposium for at least two reasons. First, although the act of walking necessarily involves placing one's feet on the surface of a particular site, Salcedo's works instrumentalize the materials either embedded within or laid just above the ground to make spectators think about place-based place identity in relation to different forms of political violence, including their own roles as implicated subjects within such violence. Second and more broadly, Salcedo's floor-based works exemplify a larger, transnational interest among artists from the mid 1950s onward in creating quote unquote walkable artworks. In, evoke, in invoking this term, I wish to describe works that not only elicit forms of ambulation, but also invite spectators to walk on the surfaces of an artwork, or in the case of shibboleth, on the surfaces within which such works are embedded and thus are impossible to tidally separate from the works themselves. As I elaborate in a recently completed book project, the deceptively simple act of walking on art, or even walking around, alongside, or across such art, has become a surprisingly powerful means to reorient a spectator's relationship to complex social political forces shaping the world in which we live. Indeed, although all artworks have the capacity to reorient our thinking, what seems crucial with walkable art is that this process of reorientation hinges on a spectator's own physical orientation vis-a-vis -vis the walkable surfaces of an artwork cited on the floor or on the ground more generally. Thank you very much. Shall we all exit radio hour for a moment. Thank you three so much for such stimulating papers. Um, a reminder to those who are attending that you can place any questions you have uh, in the Q&A function. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I thought I might get us started um, by returning to
something that came up, um, Pepe, I mean, the start of your talk in recognizing the shift from, as you put it, the category of the phenomenological to the symbolic. And it seems to me that across these three papers, we kind of see that shift perhaps happening a bit in reverse um, to return to the way that walking structures our experience of the works in your paper, Michael. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, if maybe the three of you can do a little work to think across that divide, maybe in the opposite direction of where your own papers led you. So um, Pepe, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about how perhaps um, the structure of experience or the directedness of experience that is a phenomenological view, strictly speaking, might in fact um, factor into this symbolic understanding of the four. So how, how might we in fact um, see the symbolic or the sacred as a structure of experience? Um, and Shruti, I'm curious, in many of these installations, there's works on the floor and there's works on the wall, as you're showing us. And um, could you elaborate a bit on how you understand uh, Hussein's relationship between what is on the floor and what is on the wall? And maybe something like the um, almost cinematic quality of the images that she ranges on the wall or the text, uh, and what you describe as the stillness of what she has arrayed on the floor. Um, and then, uh, Michael, I was curious, you spoke a little bit about this when you were introducing Shibboleth, but could you say more about how you understand the textual quality of Salcedo's works, um, whether it's in relationship between walking and reading as two kinds of temporal experiences, um, or between text and subtext, which seems to me something that's uh, taking place in some of those works as well. Um, I'll let you go. Oh, Pepe, you're on mute. Sorry, shall I jump in because it was the first question. Uh, thanks, great question. Um, I mean, one, uh, I think it could be argued that the whole idea of purely phenomenological experience is basically factitious and never really exists, that it's all symbolic experience, that, you know, it was a, it was a great, exciting idea in the 60s, but, um, you know, does it ever exist in a pure form where there's no meaning attached to our exploration of the environment? And actually, this connects to something I was thinking of during Michael's talk, um, looking at the last work at um, Fragmentos, I was reminded of Walt, of um, Carl Andre's, you know, uh, carpets, where he puts squares of metal on the floor, and the viewer is invited to walk on them, not just to look at them, but to walk on them. And this dates from the mid and later 60s. Well, if you've ever done that, it feels very strange. Honestly, it feels like a violent act. We've all been trained to, you know, keep a safe distance from works of art. They have to be respected and, you know, untouched. And there's something, you know, weirdly transgressive and upsetting actually about w walking on a work of art. And, you know, think of the verbal cliche of, you know, so-and-so is walking all over somebody else. Um, so, I mean, I think this raises a question uh, about first about minimalism, is there ever this detached, purely phenomenological experience, but also in fact about Salcedo and mixed messages. Um, actually, you could say this is part of the meaning, Michael, that you were proposing that we are all implicated, that even to, I mean, I've never personally firsthand experienced Fragmentos, but imagining it, I think I would feel I was committing an act of violence myself, becoming a participant in that long and horrific civil war. Michael, thoughts? Yeah, oh, sorry, I was just uh, unmuting myself. I think, um, yeah, I, I think what you're saying um, resonates. I, I would uh, maybe um, uh, tweak that a bit. I would say it doesn't necessarily reduce it to them symbolic. What I would say is um, it's maybe that phenomenal phenomenological idealism that we associate with that moment of minimalism in the 1960s and as exemplified by Carl Andre's floor work, you know, floor-based work really um, gets called into question in subsequent generations of artists such as Salcedo among uh, others. I mean, even with Andre's work, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about that, that moment, what he intended, but then for example, how protesters, you know, transformed the 
the political implications of walking on those works, for example, by staging demonstrations on it or dropping on things that people had to walk on when they were uh, themselves experiencing uh, the work. Um, the Joanna, in uh, I don't know if you want me to uh, address your question or if we want to go to Shruti uh, to think about the wall versus the floor. Um, uh, happy to do either. What makes most sense? Shruti, we want to maybe yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I want to, before I answer, uh, um, just offer my thanks to the YCBA, to Joanna, to Jennifer and Rachel. Um, I had uh, some, some technical serious uh, um, disasters. And so I'm afraid, I, I was just so nervous. And also it isn't lost on me. I'm the only graduate student here amongst very accomplished art historians. So uh, I just wanted to say that first before I begin. Um, um, it's a very, um, it's very pertinent, the idea of is it phenomenological and then I, I'm not sure if it's moving towards the symbolic in some sense of separation, that uh, there is definitely this phenomenological encounter with the object on the floor, with the work of art on the floor. Um, and I agree with what uh, Dr. Kamal just said that, um, you, I mean, it starts to, you can't really sort of remove the symbolic from it. Uh, I'm going to ask the first part, which is... Um, I think for Romana Hussein, the, there are a couple of things. One is if you think of the 60s minimalists and the way, you know, you're suddenly encountering this block um, or something on the floor, uh, there isn't that sense of anxiety at all that's created in the viewer in these works. I think she plays on uh, a sense uh, of, uh, there's a codedness. She, it's very strongly coded, the works, very, very symbolic, clearly. But she, I think, also played on or... Uh, I'm not sure she was aware of it or not, but the work plays on the works play on uh, the familiarity the viewer has to the objects. There's a sense of it somewhere belongs within your larger, I would say, cultural ethos. Or you, because when you see a terracotta object and you see this red ochre powder, uh, I didn't get to mention red ochre powder is also used in all kinds of beauty regimens, medicinal uses. So. Uh, it doesn't, I think when an, a viewer comes across these works and you find something on the floor, like you find that split open uh, urn or a pot and all this powder. Uh, and then the way she creates, um, I mean, there's a sense of that this is an object that you're going to treat it with, there is some distance and uh, dare I say deference, but there isn't going to be a railing like we see in Richard Long's work, for instance, uh, the work that Dr. Kamal showed. Um, uh, so there is a, so I would say there is, there is an encounter where the symbolism is very much being actively played on, played upon, which I think the, re the viewer in India receives. Um, it's, it's a language that's known. And, uh, and she's also deliberately, I mean, the cowrie shells, rice, these are very frequently used uh, objects, you know, um, fertility rituals and other rituals where it's very co common. So there are, multiple things that she's refer, uh, that she's sort of is able to speak to. Um, to your question about the wall and the floor, um, if that's a question I keep coming back to. And I think that she, as she was a regular easel painter and, you know, with her works hung on the wall, she probably, she transitions in this period. She's that, um, when I see there's a, there's a, you know, there's a paper on the wall and then there are objects on the floor, but then there's a mirror that reflected and then they projected back on and then she's lighting it from below or lighting it from the side. So she's aware she's she's kind of trying to create the sense of there is a, I would don't want to know if I want to immediately get to whether there is a dialectic between the two, but there is a, there's a relationship. There's also, um, and then also the bigger relationship, I think for her to pose was of wholeness and, and breakage. So you're constantly seeing these oppos opposites, you know, you see the hollows and you see the full, architectural image or you see the 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 rounded sphere uh which is convex uh the, of course the hollow of the papaya etc but also the broken terracotta the powder uh and then this keen interest in earth pigments in using earth material so i think for her to use the floor was just a very natural choice i wouldn't know if if it was, there clearly is some thought because she's, you can see she's moving to the floor uh, post this big, big, you know, this event, or I read it as her movement to the floor, but the floor seems very natural 
when I've seen these works, you didn't feel like you said um, in the way you feel you're walking, it's in your path and you're not, should you walk around it, should you not? And the, the kind of confusion it causes a viewer. Uh, there's a sense of naturalness, I'm, if I may. Um, and um, to your question about whether there's something cinematic, I would say completely. Um, and I would think one, A, she's a, she, was also, she was a performance artist, as I said, she uses photo, photographs, her own performative body. Um, so the sense of, uh, so she's playing with time, with movement already, the body moving through time. Um, and I want to also flag an important aspect, which I think is important, which is she was also an activist and post Babri Masjid, along with many, many artists in India, uh, she became an, sort of something of an artist activist or a citizen activist. So uh, I think the way the works are mounted in home or nation, have much to do with the kinds of traveling exhibitions they were they, they conducted throughout India. This was a big, you know, a move towards we mustn't forget to our secular roots and then we can't let this break us. And it was a, it was a huge uh, moment. It uh, really created a before and after. Uh, there is something very performative, very conscious, self-consciously performative about the way she's staging um, objects. And then the, in, the, in the last two works of Begum Hazrat Mahal, the shrine she creates, and then she kind of replicates that idea for something of her own too. This, uh, you know, so the, the, the stretches are made of brocade, and but you have all of this hospital paraphernalia. There is, so there's a sense of, and she calls it space for healing. So this is also about healing, reparation, uh, but also of, of death. Uh, loss um, um, and it's not some I go beautifully into the night uh, I think there's a resistance as the, that you know the, the struggle with mortality I'm not sure if I answered um, yeah, but I also just wanted to say I'm absolutely blown away by Zazero's works uh, I, I was like oh, this is it's really remarkable um, um, and also wanted to uh, just add what Dr. Kamal said that uh, I saw, uh, sorry, just wanted to add that when I saw Carla Andre's works, the ones you were speaking of, I remember seeing images, I always was under the impression that you couldn't step on them. Because I remember years ago when I read thinking, oh, but it's still an installation and you're supposed to look at it. So this is an interesting break. It, it depends on the particular museum. Uh, one odd twist is that generally the ones that are magnesium or aluminum or zinc or whatever you can walk on. Although I find the convention of don't touch the art is so strong that even though I know you're allowed to walk on them, I always look for a guard and walk over and ask, is it okay to step on the Andre before I do it? The ones you can't walk on are the ones made from lead because they figure out that when you walk on them, you create lead dust, which is poisonous. So it's not to protect the art, it's to protect the visitors. On another topic, footnote to, to your wonderful talk, um, Rumana Hussein's tomb of Begum Hazrat Mahal is currently on view in New York at the um, yes, Institute I was, and I was going to at 22 history. Christopher Street. So, you know, if you're anywhere yes, in the area. Have you seen it? No, I tried one day. Have and, you already seen it? No, I, I, I went there a week or two ago and there were several of us gathered outside knocking on the door and it turned out, um, I, I spoke to, I'm sorry, which gallery represents her estate. I emailed them and said, I tried to see it. They said, it's crazy, but there was a gas leak next door and Con Ed made us evacuate the building. But I'm planning on going back next week. Oh, wonderful. I've, I have a bunch of people I've asked who, who've been deputed to go see it, video it, and they must come and tell me how it was. Because I'm too far away. Um, just, uh, Joanna, you had asked the question about uh, the use of text that I was going to um, address. I think that's a really thoughtful question because uh, it really changes in these three works. Um, so, you know, you can, in uh, Shibboleth, there's this really strong attempt to kind of um, define the author or the maker's intentions, you know, through um, free exhibition booklets, uh, the exhibition proposal, which is in the catalog, just lots of interpretive materials. So you're supposed to know what this is about. Um, a lot of people didn't read that and, and treated it, you know, as, as a form of entertainment. Um, so which made Salcedo think that the mode of address that she had attempted in this work didn't um, wasn't what she envisioned. 
With palimpsest, she does something which she acknowledges was a complete 180 degree turn in her work, which is her use of proper names. Uh, and she does that because um, during the over the course of her research, interviewing uh, parents of those who had died, she you know there was the singularity of the you know the a, one life and that could that was irreplaceable and to name was the way to make those lives grievable. Um, you know to borrow a, um, a phrase that she used uh, based on on others. Um, so I think that you know she's. She's saying, I acknowledge that specificity by using those, uh, those words. In Fragmentos, I think it's a bit different. I, the work uh, you know, just provokes incredibly strong uh, reactions. I mean, despite visually looking similar to uh, an Andre uh, sculpture, you know, people break down in tears because the history of those weapons and, and the war and the everything that that went into them is just so overwhelming for a lot of the visitors and they know what they're going to do. So there's not so much this attempt to articulate the uh, maker's own intentions, but there is an attempt to capture the survivors of sexual violence in their own worlds. Uh, so there's a documentary film that, um, that uh, visitors can choose to watch while they're um, while they're there, and they hear the um, those women who are you know responsible for making the the models for those uh, floor squares um, uh, in their own words. So I think there's a there's a shift in how language operates there. Um, Thank you so much. We've got a couple questions that have come in. Um, so this one is from Andrew Taylor, who writes: Does Pepe consider Anthony Caro's move from plinth to floor of great significance in the context of today's subject? Uh, short answer, yes, but the, the works of his that I find super exciting in that respect are some pieces he did, I think in the mid 70s, I remember seeing them when I was a college student, uh, that are mounted on pedestals, but they go over the edge. So they both, you know, lay claim to the virtual space of the pedestal and then emerge into real space. Uh, yeah, no, Caro is, a, I mean, A, an extraordinary sculptor, and B, someone who has engaged with these questions, you know, in very interesting ways throughout his career. There's a really good question, I think, from Rachel or posted by Rachel for Michael here in the in the chat. Um, is, let me read that so that our, our attendees can hear it. So this is from Rachel Stratton, and it's from Michael. Um, she writes... I'm interested in how the role of the institution in these viewing experiences, and particularly I'm thinking about the institutional control over how the body is allowed to move around and across these works. So we had a little conversation around Andre about this, but I think there's more to say. Um, continuing on, uh, in Salcedo Shibboleth, there is a liability for the institution should a viewer lose their balance and hurt themselves. Michael, could you comment on how Salcedo navigates these institutional power dynamics and whether you have thoughts about why, in this process of reorienting the spectator as an implicated subject, she would then place them back into a space that is so rife with the hierarchies of power. Oh, Michael, you're on mute. That is a fantastic question, Rachel, and one I am certain uh, uh, Salcedo wrestles with uh, very deeply. Um, so, I mean, in Shibboleth, I think that, I mean, that there's a deliberate attempt, you know, it, it functions as a form of institutional critique and a critique of this, you know, the hierarchies of, of beauty that, um, that museums advance through the artworks that they collect and display. So I think that she's very conscious in the case of Shibboleth of the fact that it is in an institution with that power and is trying to subvert that power. I talk about that move as a sort of decolonial crack that she's trying to place into the museum institution in this, you know, the chapter of the book that I, I finished. Um, uh, let's see, with um, with Palimpsest, I think it's just, it's tricky because that, you know, it was commissioned by Renya Sophia and, you know, how do you do honor to uh, and mourn these deaths, which was something she wanted to do. She described, that move as one where she wanted it, she wanted to bring those names to, you know, the cultural center to a major uh, art institution in Europe because it was precisely, you know, Europe and its its center that um, 
were that you know, were rejecting uh, those and, and causing their deaths either explicitly or implicitly. Um, with fragmentos, that is a really tricky thing. I mean, um, it's the um, Columbia, you know, National Museums. Uh, uh, fragmentos is part of that and, and administered by that um, in, um, that that group. Uh, when the you know there was a far right um, you know leader of Colombia who uh, decided to hold meetings at that space um, uh, in order basically to whitewash the violence that was committed against protesters um, you know uh, against the government and uh, you know she denounced that in the strongest possible terms but I think that for me that you know that that act of um, reverse that power reversal that she describes of walking on those um, those uh, those floor slabs that itself can get reversed and I think she's continuously attuned to that um, that you know this is part of a space of art and memory so there can be various events held on that surface um, uh, which included this um, you know this government sponsored thing so um, it's a it's a it's a tenuous uh, relationship to the institutional powers to say the least. If we have a, another minute or two, I'd like to bring up a question that um, Rachel's question poses that came up, um, Michael, early in your talk when you were talking about shibboleth and you said many spectators fail to grasp the work's meaning and um, Shruti, in your discussion of you know the complex symbolism of Hussein's work, which is an ambiguity, and I would almost go as far as to say hypocrisy in our idea of avant-garde art that also wants to be political. Um, that you know, we make not we, not you, not the four or five of us here, but you know, artists make work that is meant to that has a political meaning and is meant to have a political effect, but is couched in what is at the end of the day a very esoteric language. That is comprehensible to those, you know, with cultural capital to a bourgeois elite, and you know, is that a contradiction? Is that hypocritical, or is it a reality of our society that political change is affected, is created via a bourgeois elite, and that yeah, those are the people you need to talk to. I mean, just to hop in here for because I'm mean, sure Tim, I'm interested to hear what you'll say about this because it seems like some of the materials there are comprehensible far beyond a bourgeois elite, and in fact might be somewhat elusive to people who would consider themselves part of that group. Um, but it seems to get at how all of these papers are thinking about the difference between the body, to th go think back to the title of this panel, um, and bodies or particular bodies, specific bodies. Um, but Shruti, I saw you were about to speak. Um, no, I was thinking about, um, it, first of all, I think it, it's, uh, that it is, it is problematic. Uh, it, 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 you know, uh, the hierarchies or the, the, um, to the word really I want, um, you know, the, the, uh, the this language that we've created and the expectation of artists and also again of, the, of course, very well-read art critics and art historians who are going to interpret them. But absolutely, it shouldn't the fundamental um, uh, purpose of art really be to communicate to this, of course, bourgeois uh, audience. Uh, in Hossein's case, to respond specifically, um, I think uh, she really manages to break that very well because um much of it is a very sort of language she's evolving as she was going along she the multiple things happening it seems like really compacted because she does this this entire practice is in um is 93 to 99 um in an extremely short period where the language is dramatically shifted from like she was painting on canvas i think in 91 or 92 um one is uh, that there is a sense of so for her it's also accelerated time because that there isn't time um, I think she really is playing, she's breaking that very, very, very well. Uh, even in the earlier works, you can see there's much more, there's a formal structure to the work. There's a sense that this is work that has to be received a certain way. But then she begins to, to change that in the, and then she's also doing the multi, like it's like a room, multi-part installation, so which is automatically asking the viewer to go to different parts and then the viewer is going to see things differently. She also is breaking, I mean, there's a deliberate, uh, um, con there's a constant bringing of, uh, you know, ancient, like older time, maybe medieval period against the current. So 
uh, to make a political statement. So where she she it seems to me like she refuses this this kind of Muslim identity in this othering. It's like if you're going to other me, I refute it. But on the other hand, I also speak for myself as this Muslim citizen. And the things she brings forth are, um, you know, so if you look at archi mixed architectural elements, um, which bring 1500, 1600s into the present day, but into a very present day, I mean, contestations on the, of the present day, right, which are very much on the Muslim body. Um, and then the, for her, the body is so central, absolutely, uh, in this artist's work for sure. From the beginning, although the, the objects that are, are already symbolic of the body, her engagement is very visceral uh, and, and the audience responds similarly. And then she gets into performance art. So she's uh, placing her own body in, you know, is the art. Um, um, and then she constantly moves. And, um, and then the use of the objects, like I said, those, uh, the pigments or the uh, they're not necessarily votive or sacred but there is this it's part of a uh, so it's both uh, um, of an earlier time um, and also labor there are multiple things that she talks about and that I'm remembering uh, the way she fronts labor women's labor labor of cooking birthing cleaning dyeing fabric all that is on the floor but also this is rooted in the indic uh, so to that extent, I think she knows it's very um, it's very readable to the audience that she's presenting to. However, I must say she presented a lot of her work in New York and it was very well received as well. So it's uh, I don't know if they saw it as exotic. Um, that particular performance I showed you was in was in Amsterdam. And, um, and of course, Begum Hell is now is being shown in New York. Um, it's it's uh, it, it works where it's using codes like she's using the the implements to form the Arabic words in the wall. So she's doing what, uh, you know, it's a very sophisticated artist's language, but also the moment she creates a grave on the floor, it needs no decoding almost. There's a very different response you have to this that you, you know, you know, this is already a space that's been made somehow sacred or, and she's playing with that. Uh, and also of, of spillage, dirt, body, death. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Do you want to say a very I quick word? In our remaining minute, I think you may still be on mute. Are you? Um, if not, I, I wasn't sure if that was di uh, directed to Pepe or or, or me. Uh, oh, it was to you, Michael. If you wanted to, very briefly. Wait, I, about the issue of the grape not even requiring decoding or uh, which uh, point where we, I mean, to me, that seemed like a, a through line uh, in all three talks. I, I'm thinking of um, like, Pepe, you mentioned the Anna Mendieta uh, Silhouetta series, um, uh, Shruti, you know, these works, you know, evoke um, uh, that, you know, you were, you're talking about grave as well, or um, um, uh, burial with Salcedo, there's the topology of mourning. Um, so I, but what's, I guess, interesting to me is that all of these artists are stretching that in so many different directions and, um, and uh, you know, allowing the spectators to think about their own relation uh, to the body that's either represented, symbolized, um, you know, through those floor-based uh, works. You know, Mendieta does that in a fascinating way through, um, you know, the, uh, the what you see in the um, uh, there, but then also the angle of the uh, the images that's often used for those. Absolutely, um, that is our time for this panel this morning. Thank you three so much for your contributions, and thank you to our audience. There's a 15 minute break now, so you can stretch your legs, and then the next panel begins at 10:45. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so you very much. My name is Alexis Lowry. I'm the curator at Dia Art Foundation, and it's my pleasure to chair our next um, panel to Land, City, uh, and Planet. Um, it's also my pleasure to get to introduce our three panelists. Um, so Joyce Lehman is a professor of art history and theory at the Slade School of Fine Art, uh, UCL. A writer and curator, her research is focused on the histories of sculpture and landscape, especially 1960s and 70s land art. 
with Nicholas Alfrey and Ben Tucknell, she co-curated the UK touring exhibition, Uncommon Ground, Land Art in Britain, 1966 to 1979. And with Rebecca Partridge, she's co-curator of the exhibition, Expanding Painting, Landscape After Land Art at Hester Combe Gallery um, in Somerset from 2022 to next year, 2023. Her publications include essays, seven scenes and 14 stills from the work of David Lamelas, Lawrence Alloway, Robert Smith and Smithson and Earthworks and Land Art and the Moon Landing. Uh, and a book on Roloff Lou and British sculpture since, 19, since the 1960s. Joy has a strong commitment to public engagement and developing scholarship and understanding of art related to landscape and environment in public arenas and artistic communities. Marin R. Sullivan, who received a PhD from the University, University of Michigan, is a Chicago-based art historian, curator, and educator, and consultant. She specializes in the histories of modern and contemporary sculpture, especially its interdisciplinary intermedial dialogues with photography, design, and the built environment. Sullivan is the director of the Harry Botoya Catalog Resume and co-curator of Harry Botoya Sculpting mid-century modern life organized by the Nasher Sculpture Center. She's the author of Alloys, American Sculpture and Architecture at Mid-Century and Sculptural Materiality in the Age of Conceptualism, as well as numerous essays and articles in publications, including American Art, Art History, History of Photography, the Journal of Curatorial Studies and Sculpture Journal. Finally, our last speaker, Elise Speaks, um, teaches art history at the University of Notre Dame and her research and writing focus on the history of modern and contemporary sculpture and installation. Her research focuses on the intersection of installation, gender, and race in art from the 1970s to the 1990s, particularly through the lens of processes often considered to be amateur, blue collar, untrained, or craft based. She's published essays and anthologies in anthologies and journals, including American Art, Art Journal, The Journal of Modern Craft, and The Sculpture Journal. And having seen a sneak peek of everybody's PowerPoints yesterday, I can say we're all in for a really interesting um, hour plus. So I will get over. Thank you, Alexis. Um, thank you, fellow panelists. And hello from a very cold London. Um, sharing screen. Can you not see my PowerPoint? And the show. You can't see the PowerPoint. No, we're still seeing seeing you. Oh dear. This all worked yesterday. I know. <laughs> sure, we did do work. a test run, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we did. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So now. Yes. Looks great, yes. Perfect, okay. In 1968, David Lamelas placed painted metal plates around three objects, a tree, a lamppost and a deck chair in London's Hyde Park. His signaling of three objects repeated a work he had made two years earlier in a park in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He arrived in London from Argentina in 1968 to study in the sculpture department at St. Martin's School of Art. By 1968, Lamelas's work had moved on to incorporate social systems, the media, photography, text and film. But in London, Lamelas continued to make work sculptural enough to satisfy his course tutor, Anthony Caro. Presenting a work made of metal plates cut from a large sheet and placed on the floor and a metal table, Caro was suitably convinced of Lamelas's work's sculptural credentials. According to Lamelas, Caro noted only that it would be better if painted. Signaling of three objects is a work Lamelas has made numerous times since. South African born artist Roloff Lowe cast, placed cast iron wedges in the streets of London's West End early on a Sunday morning photographing them in situ, placing each at a distance such that the next wedge was just visible from the vantage point of the previous one. 
His description of the work in three photographs appeared in the catalogue to the exhibition When Attitudes Become Form at all three venues of the exhibition in 1969. Six large photographs of the work were shown in its first venue in Bern and were recreated for an exhibition revisiting the Bern show at the Fondazione Prada in Venice in 2013. Occasioned by his inclusion in the London showing of When Attitudes Become Form at London's ICA, American artist Robert Smithson and his wife, the artist Nancy Holt, came to London and stayed for around six weeks in late August and September 1969, travelling through England and Wales, making work in several locations, including on Dartmoor. Holt Trail Markers was made on a short stretch of the granite upland between Three Bridges and Wisman's Wood. Each photograph includes one of the painted dots used to mark the path. Each of these works manifests a method for delimiting the view of the environment, whether by close cropping of the image, focusing on one wedge in situ or on one marker on the trail, or demarcating a single object as if indicating where to cut it out on dotted lines on a box net or diagram. Rather than the overview of a disembodied eye in an installation view in a gallery, as described by Patrick O'Doherty in Inside the White Cube, these photographs are taken from eye level by a human standing on the same ground as the sculpture or object. Lowe's description of his Park Lane work in 1969 reads, the object is made integral with its surroundings. This establishes a state of affairs that makes aspects of experience relevant to both explicit. This may also be considered as a way of taking possession of the environment. These are insistently ground-based works. The ultimate off-ground work might be the satellite in space. Jack Burnham's chapter on sculpture's disappearing base in Beyond Modern Sculpture of 1968 concludes with examples of sculptures hovering or floating above their bases. It might also apply to Lowe's 1969 rope sculpture suspended from the roof ties of Stockwell Depot. Lowe's work was remade in 2016, and I'd be interested to compare this work to the rope piece by Marin Hassinger of 1972, which was remade last year. On this day, 50 years ago, in December 1972, Jean Cernan and Jack Smith, the last humans to walk on the moon, were on their way back to Earth. The text on the reverse of this card, announcing an exhibition by Richard Long at Yvonne Lambert Gallery in Paris in 1972 reads, look the ground in the eye. But what ground are we looking at? There's no horizon. There are rocks and what look to be tufts of grass, perhaps mosses. There are a few larger sharp edged rocks and looking closer, what appears to be a rectangular area of flat stones seen diagonally across the photograph, as if forming a kind of paved area on the ground. Were these placed here by the artist, or found here is this stone flooring, the remains of a prehistoric dwelling? Quite possibly the kind of natural ground in one of the areas of Upland Moor long frequented on his walks in the British Isles, and that served as locations for his artworks from the late 1960s onwards, most notably Dartmoor in southwest England. Dartmoor merits a chapter of its own in the catalogue to long solo exhibition at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in 1986. In it, Rudy Fuchs writes, I quote, this place to Richard Long is above all an area of ground surface, which is not to deny that it has presence and atmosphere. It is, writes Fuchs, above all a type of ground or surface, neither very high nor low, nowhere divided by deep gorges with spare vegetation, rocks and tors, streams and bogs, as well as remnants of ancient human habitation, like footpaths, cairns, clapper bridges, old clay pits, scattered sewn circles, foundations for prehistoric huts. Fuchs rather underestimates the evidence of past human, human habitation on Dartmoor. There are some 1500 hut circles, evidence that potentially a population of tens of thousands lived here in prehistoric times. There's also evidence of recent industrial activity, including the remains of a granite railway. 
There's other evidence in Long's early exhibition announcement cards of past depopulation. This repurposed commercially produced postcard from his second one person exhibition at Conrad Fisher's Gallery Dusseldorf in 1969 shows the abandoned ruins of, of homes on St Kilda in the Scottish islands of Herta following the evacuation of the entire population, not in ancient times, but in 1930. Like the surface of the moon, maybe, only marked by a few remnants of human exploration half a century ago, some footprints, some ritual objects, fabricated tools, a lost hammer, and other debris, a few bags of urine. According to Andrew Chaikin's account, and I quote, after the penultimate moonwalk in the early hours of December the 16th, December the 13th, 1972, Cernan and Schmidt were bedding down for a well-deserved rest when Joe Allen, taking the night shift in mission control, told them that the flight controllers were still marvelling at the beautiful television pictures coming down from Taurus Littro. They were fascinated by the footprints and the rover tracks, and they were speculating on what might someday disturb them after Cernan and Schmidt had departed. That's an interesting thought, Joe, Cernan replied, but I think we all know that somewhere, someday, someone will be here to disturb those tracks. I'd written to Long to ask if he had a copy of the card that accompanied an earlier exhibition at Yvonne Lambert Gallery in 1969, where he'd used a photograph taken from an airplane looking down on the French Alps, viewed from 6,406 metres, 405 metres. I wanted to include it in an exhibition occasioned by the 40th anniversary of the first Apollo moon landing in July 1969. And the photograph of the Alps from the air captured where the artist was at that moment, traveling by air on his way to Africa, looking down at the earth, if not from so great a distance as the Apollo astronauts, then from a distance only available routinely to most humans from the middle of the 20th century. Long sent this card instead. I remember feeling a bit disappointed. But for our exhibition, it enabled us to stage rather neatly a familiar narrative about the Apollo space program, that it marked not only the first exploration of the moon, but the rediscovery or reappraisal of the earth. In famous images such as Earthrise or the Blue Marble, Apollo images of Earth inspired or reawakened planetary awareness and galvanized a nascent ecological movement. Or so the story goes. Some years earlier, at the dawn of the space race with the launch of Sputnik 1 by the USSR in 1957, Hannah Arendt had famously remarked on humans' first step towards, and I quote, escape from man's imprisonment on, a, on the earth. Did we learn to love the earth? I think no, we realize just how much humans can hate it. Tamed as lawn or paved over, we make our survival by ripping out the earth's entrails and burning them. It's not the planet that's endangered, but us humans. There have been extinctions before and human population collapses a combination of extraterrestrial and terrestrial events, meteor impacts, volcanoes, weather, disease, loss of habitat, competition for resources. Escape, and going back to the moon, is back on the agenda today, 50 years on from the first Apollo moon landings. In the future historical account, this will not seem very long, a continuity in less than a single human out lifespan. The focus now is on habitability, living in space and on extraterrestrial worlds, not just exploration. Back in the days of Apollo, it was a, one scientist and military men. Now it will be artists, people of color, female and non-binary gendered people, DJs. On the UK broadcast news on Sunday 11th of December, a report that the Orion mission had splashed down, a successful end to the rehearsal for the next moon landing. That night, heavy snow fell in London and I woke to a thick blanket of snow, forcing my grounding to home. I realized that on the previous Thursday evening while walking to the pub, 
I'd seen Mars in the sky, close to the full moon. I'd seen the next human journey mapped in the skies. Meanwhile, back on Earth, had this conference been held in real life rather than virtually, my transatlantic flight might well have been disrupted by the snow. In our virtual world, as long as the power and the satellites stay operational, we will remain connected. I remembered that David Harvey's The Condition of Postmodernism book from 1989 had a diagram of time-space compression due to speed of communications. Back then, in the 1980s and 90s, we, USA and UK, were the closest we've ever been in terms of commercial space flight via Concorde. Now we're able to be in the same space simultaneously, but we can't stand on the same ground and we can't touch one another. As I wrote this paper, I kept thinking, when does the ground become a floor? This took me back to look at the postcard again, sent by Richard Long. What are we looking at? Is this rectangle of stones made by the artist or found somewhere like Dartmoor, the floor of an ancient dwelling? There's no horizon, we're just looking down at the floor. In recognizing the remains of a human dwelling on Dartmoor, one perceives a floor. The floor is lower than the natural ground. It's something you excavate to make or to reveal. This is from Worth's Dartmoor, a book from the 1950s. I quote, the actual depth at which the floor li lies was determined by the amount of topsoil which it was necessary to remove to arrive at the surface of the gravelly subsoil of decomposed granite or grauen. It would appear that the first step towards the construction of a hut was the removal of turf or topsoil over the whole area to be occupied by floor and wall. Some of Long's earliest sculptural endeavours involved removal of turf and topsoil in urban gardens in Bristol. Might we then consider the floor as the negative of the plinth, a digging down, not a raising up, not just placing on the ground, but beneath the ground, as something phonic, to use a term related to Long's work and use of his work as early as 1976. Dipesh Chakrabarti recently wrote, I quote, the key term in planetary thinking that one could contrapose to the idea of sustainability in global thought is habitability. Habitability does not reference humans. Its central concern is life, complex multicellular life in general, and what makes that, not humans alone, sustainable. What makes a planet habitable? especially when, as Chakrabarti remarks, the sample size of habitable planets so far for study is only one. Humans are not central to the problem of habitability, but habitability is central to human existence. If the planet were not habitable for complex life, we simply would not be here, says Chakrabarti. I'm not sure this is really a strong differentiation between Arendt and late thinkers. Arendt absolutely talks about habitat. She wrote, and I quote, the earth is the very quintessence of the human condition and earthly nature for all we know may be unique in the universe in providing human beings with a habitat in which they can move and breathe without effort and without artifice. The human artifice of the world separates human existence from all mere animal environment, but life itself is outside this artificial world and through life, man remains related to all other living organisms. According to Chakrabarti, we are all living, whether we acknowledge it or not, at the cusp of the global and the planetary. The age of the global is ending, and yet the quotidian is about both invoking the planetary and losing sight of it in the next moment. Looking down is not always the omniscient overview, as we heard in papers earlier this morning too. If your feet are on the ground, it can be wayfinding or navigating rough terrain. It can be looking the ground in the eye. What are all these artists doing looking at the ground? and looking at it intently 
noting or demarcating, drawing attention to things that are already there, street furniture, way markers, curbs, signs of past human habitation. Is this the return or rediscovery of planet Earth, the effect of seeing the blue marble of our Earth? Is it as a finite or limited resource, is often seen as the, which is often seen as the impetus to renewed planetary awareness and care? The first Earth Day inaugurated nine months, the terms of, term of human gestation after the first moon landing. In the moment of human extraterrestrial travel and the first setting foot on the ground of a non-Earth, humans are no longer Earth-bound. Marking our alienation from our planet, it's a birth of a new kind of human, but it's also a profound experience of postpartum separation and the beginning of a process, one we see continued today, and not simply the birth of a fully formed post-extraterrestrial human, we are having to learn how to live in a world where we have killed or at least repudiated our mother nature. We are learning how to deal with our separation anxiety. Hannah Arendt talked of alienation from the self and from the world and of the deep human desire to escape planet Earth. She calls on us to understand the desire to escape and the profound hatred humans feel towards nature. Without this recognition, it's hard to also to understand the effort it takes to rebuild trust and love and to save a world that nurtures, but also threatens to destroy us. From the prologue to the human condition. Should the emancipation and secularization of the modern age, which began with a turning away, not necessarily from God, but from a God who was the father of men in heaven, end with a more, even more fateful repudiation of an earth who was the mother of all living creatures under the sky. The last humans to set foot on the moon were on their way back to earth almost exactly 50 years ago. Saturday, December the 16th, 5.45 p.m. Houston time. Nine days, 21 hours, one minute, mission elapsed time. I quote, when the SBS engine shut down and a perfect trans-earth injection burn was behind them, Cernan's crew broke out the television camera. When America, the command module of Apollo 17, regained contact with Earth, they broadcast a view of a huge and nearly full moon. Part of the far side was still visible including Salkovsky. In December 1972, they left, glancing to the dark side of the moon and the crater named for Salkovsky, the Russian scientist who is unnamed in Hannah Arendt's prologue to the human condition, but whose epitaph carved on his funeral obelisk, she quotes, mankind will not remain bound to the earth forever. Visiting depopulated sites on Earth, such as Dartmoor, seeing the remains of past human habitation that became unsustainable, and also geologically, that are at the limit of the glaciation in the last ice age. In retrospect, these seem wholly appropriate places to ground sculpture on the cusp of the global and the planetary. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. I want to um, jump in really quickly before Maren goes to say something I should have said at the very beginning, which is just that um, the to ask questions, um, please use the Q&A function, which I'll moderate at the end of this um, session, but, but just wanted to remind everybody that it's there. And please feel free to drop in your questions as we go or after all the speakers. Okay, sorry. Back to you, Maren. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that and hear me okay. Um, I guess from outer space, we're gonna go um, <laughs> into uh, the bowels of the earth uh, with this paper instead. Uh, for the bulk of history, sculpture has been placed on a pedestal. This quality of elevation has become so rooted that the phrase 
quote, to put something on a pedestal is now colloquially used to suggest glorified reverence or utmost sometimes unreachable importance. As we will, uh, as, as we will and have already heard today, however, a shift in modern sculptural practice led to a literal debasement of the medium. The descent of sculptural objects from the pedestal to the floor coincided with an opening up and a breaking down of the medium's volumes and masses, a fragmentation and carving out of its solid forms. This increased porosity was enough of a phenomenon that by 1948, for example, the writer, psychologist, and art theorist Rudolf Arnheim was publishing an essay on the holes of Henry Moore. While the subject was ostensibly the preponderance of holes in Moore's sculptures, of the concave surfaces that formed hollow containers of space, Arnheim was particularly interested in where such a principle of concavity would lead within the medium of sculpture itself. The essay, in fact, was subtitled On the Function of Space in Sculpture, and he concludes it by suggesting that the presence of holes in more sculpture points to the possibility of experiencing interiority through sculpture on a scale that had previously been limited to architecture. Writing two decades prior to the seismic shift in the scale and presentation of sculpture manifested in tendencies like minimalism, post-minimalism, and land art, Arnheim wondered, quote, is there any aesthetic law to prevent the sculptor from creating hollow interiors, works one would have to walk into in order to see? What prospects are opened by Moore's attempt to decompose large volumes into configurations of slimmer units freely separated by interstices, uh, end quote. Though rarely thought of today within such context, Moore's holes, uh, whole sculptures indeed, as Arnheim stated, envisioned new interrelationships of sculpture and architecture in which the building would be more than an enclosing box, the statue more than an enrichment of walls. Whether or not one acknowledges a direct line for Moore's earliest inconsistent experiments in transparency and openness to the vanguard experimental practices of the post-war period, by the late 1960s, the holes of his carved and cast figures had given way to literal holes carved in architecture, as seen, for example, in the work of Gordon Maddox Clark, or sculpture which expanded the wall outward, using the hole to great architectural and psychological effect, as in the work of Lee Bontecu. But what really is a hole in the context of sculpture? Um, in, in the context of a medium that has historically been characterized by solid mass and palpable shaped matter. And beyond that, what even is a hole? I don't think I'll be offering any satisfying answers to these questions um, today, certainly not in my allotted 20 minutes, but I do think that they're questions worth asking, worth exploring. The philosophers Roberto Cassati and Achille Vazzi note that we widely accept holes into our basic ontological inventory alongside things like tables, stones, and drops of oil. And yet as slippery, elusive entities, they are quote, more disturbing than those other entities, more uncomfortable to live with. Perhaps only a dry-minded philosopher would hazard questioning the reality of tables and stones, but just ask any person to tell you what holes are, real, everyday holes, not the abstract holes of geometry, and they will likely elaborate on absences, non-entities, nothingness, things that are not there. Are there such things? End quote. Thingness, the palpable presence of three-dimensional objects, has arguably been as fundamental to the definition of sculpture as its placement on pedestals. So how can we reconcile such a core principle with the increased presence, or perhaps better put, absence, that holes in body? In their attempt to define what a hole actually is, Cassati and Vazzi suggest an answer that is particularly useful in addressing holes in the context of sculpture, one that is focused on the shared qualities of space. They write, quote, holes are spacious. They are made of space. They consist of bare, unqualified matter 
they are, we shall say, immaterial bodies growing parasitically like negative mushrooms at the surfaces of material bodies, end quote. So while at first uh, it may seem incongruous to sculpture, holes and their increased visibility, whether empty or not, plays a compelling, indeed parasitic part in sculpture's recent changing trajectory, including its shift off the pedestal. In my brief time today, I will not be able to analyze the complex philosophical or scientific definitions of holes, nor offer a comprehensive overview of sculptures that use, create, or manipulate the concepts and forms of holes. And, and I think if we took that kind of theme um, more broadly, right, uh, there's holes everywhere, like drawn holes, projected holes, cut out holes, right? Um, but uh, this paper today is going to briefly highlight some examples of artists who did not merely incorporate holes into their work, but literally created holes that are sculpture and sculpture that are holes. And due to the nature of the talk, a lot of these projects are getting really short shrift in the discussion, but I think um, you, you should hopefully get why I'm at least uh, selecting them as, as highlights. The artists I'm going to discuss today did not simply um, place objects on the floor or make indents or superficial marks within it, but rather realized structural excavations, inhabitable holes, and deep fissures. While many of these projects explore specificities of place and the politics of landscape, they also frequently interrogate and evoke far more universal existentialist concepts of death, loss, and unknown abysses suggesting that sculpture can also ask questions about invisible forces, histories, and the spaces below our feet. Sculptural explorations into the seemingly endless possibilities of space, scale, and orientation from the post-war period to the present occurred both inside and outside the gallery. But as artists um, in the late 1960s increasingly turned to the earth to outdoor environs, whether natural or urban to create and display their art, more and more holes in the ground began to appear. Some projects took the form of holes through acts of erosion um, or hollowing out of solid matter while not adhering to the more typical circular or rectangular forms that perhaps most readily come to mind when envisioning a hole, Richard Long's a, walk, a Line Made by Walking can be seen as a kind of grinding down, an erosion of the land under the artist's feet. Plenty though of more overt examples of holes that functions as opening gaps, caves, voids, burrows, chasms, pits, craters, and depressions can easily be found. Andy Goldsworthy has remarked on his evergreen obsession with holes, particularly the black hole in his work found in and created by the forms of nature. He states, quote, I will always make them, meaning holes. I'm drawn to them with the same urge I have to look over a cliff edge. It is possible the last work I ever make will be a hole, end quote. For artists like uh, Nobuo Sakina and those associated with the Monoha in Japan in the late 1960s, there was an immense power in making visible the relationship between negative space and the materiality of the earth, of making visible something which is often hard to see, to grasp. Faye's Mother Earth consisted of a hole dug in the ground nearly nine feet deep and seven feet wide, and the excavated dirt compacted into a mold, which was then subsequently removed to review a cylindrical tower of earth standing next to its inverted form in the ground. Sakina recalled of the moment of the work's completion, quote, Faced with this solid block of raw earth, the power of this object of reality rendered everybody speechless and we stood there, rooted to the spot. I just wondered at the power of the convex and concave earth, the sheer physicality of it. I could feel the passing of time's quiet emptiness, end quote. Like the artists of the Monoha who were drawn to the dual poles of negative space and the raw matter of earth, Michael Heitzer has made both the concept and the form of the whole central to his artistic practice since the 1960s. They are acutely visible uh, primary features of his projects like Double Negative and North East South West, which was reconfigured in 2002 and remains, view, uh, remains on view at Dia Beacon. <clears throat> 
its four basic geometric shapes acting as ominous, unknown voids, each 20 feet deep and inaccessible in more ways than one. For many artists, however, the emphasis has been more on a ritualistic, bodily, or performative aspect of making holes, in the act of digging itself, or of implanting the body in subterranean earth and space. In such works like Keith Arnett's Self Ariel, there is often an overt suggestion of a particular type of hole in the ground, graves and burial sites which call to mind existential metaphors and literal evocations of death. Ana Mendieta, who we've also heard a little bit about today in her earth body work, similarly explored powerful primordial connections between holes, corporeal presence, and the earth. Such performative practices often mediated for the viewer after the fact through photographic documentation rather than a direct experience of holes underfoot also frequently draw from a diverse range of cross-cultural, ceremonial, religious, or spiritual practices, whether um, of uh, those of the Yoruba and other West African peoples or Roman Catholicism in the case of uh, Houston Conwell, or Judaism and the indigenous peoples of California in the case of Carl Levine, whose recent project, Dig a Hole to Put Your Grief Into, also incorporated a communal collective act of digging and memorialization. In each case, there is also a built-in intentional element of ephemerality that such acts, performances, or physical hold themselves are susceptible to the elements and will eventually disappear, further eroded or filled in and left again to the whims and temporality of nature. In such works, holes become powerful if temporary symbols of mourning, creating fleeting traces of grief, loss, and passing. There is something about the nothingness, the emptiness of holes that evokes existential melancholy, even without such performative elements or overt spiritual connections. Holes, holes afford plenty of openness and space for profound examinations of socio-political issues as well. Doris Salcedo, who Michael has uh, already really wonderfully talked about, for example, has mined the seemingly empty space of fissures, of breaks in ex existing architecture to conjure concepts of identity and immigration. In Shibboleth, essentially a temporary rupture in the floor of Tate Modern, Salcedo drew the viewer into a different vantage point in relationship to the artwork, encouraging alternative perspectives, both phenomenologically and conceptually, that underscore positions of difference. Christina Iglesias' uh, recent intervention into Madison Square Park in New York similarly used the metaphor and form of fissure to call attention to movements and histories that would otherwise be invisible. For landscape and memory, Iglesias excavated the geographic topological history of the park, tracing the path of two flowing bodies of water that once ran through it and then traced that um, uh, back by inserting cast bronze lacerations into the park's lawns. She stated of the project, quote, I have developed work that concentrates on ideas of what my what might lie underneath us, of what my what might grow rhizomatically around us, of underground waters that still flow and ebb if unveiled. And I have asked audiences to slow down and grant my work perhaps more time than what they were what they are used to, end quote. While projects like Salcedo and Iglesias's powerfully and simultaneously evoke notions of nothingness and a literal unearthing of things and spaces forgotten, it is perhaps this physical and optical reorientation of viewing that reviews these, uh, reveals these sculptural holes to have such great psychological impact and sheer physical unsettling presence. This is art that is not frontal, not something to be optically gazed at from a distance or instantly grasped as a, as a cohesive known entity. There is instead a built-in slowness that Iglesias points to, a way in which their size and depth often requires peripatetic looking, crouching down, peering in, circumnavigating, reminding us of our phenomenological experience of the world, our orientation to the ground, to the earth, to the places we walk, rest, exist on and in. <laughs> 
if one grants the work to again use Iglesias's phrasing, this amount of time and effort, however, um, these projects often refuse to fully unveil themselves or make their forms fully knowable, understandable. They're too big, too much, too spatially immaterial to grasp. There is also something of a pervasive ominous feeling that radiates from sculptures that are holes, whether in the floor or the ground, resting just underneath the surface of terrifying instability and uncertainty. Anish Kapoor has frequently manipulated this awesome sublimity to great effect in his work, perhaps most acutely in his dissension descent works, comprised of swirling whirlpools and gaping vanta black holes. Kapoor has discussed such projects in the context of the void and the moment when it is not a hole but a space full of what is not there. It's hard not to see, to experience these works, however, as intangible fears made palpable, menacing reminders that what we stand on is not solid and that the floor can indeed fall out from us at any moment. There is a sense of danger, and indeed, at least in the case of a recent installation of Kapoor's descent into limbo, a literal fall by one visitor into the eight foot deep hole. He was okay. Um, the perhaps unavoidably destructive negative connotations of holes and sculptures that function as or evoke holes is baked into their creation. There is an unavoidably aggressive, violent aspect of hole making predicated on the reductive act of taking away. Matter is cut, scraped, jackhammered, um, dug into, sliced, cleaved, scorched, pounded, eroded, removing something that has been solid, stable, complete, in order to expose nothing, an empty space, gap, or abyss. In the case of Urs Fischer, who 2007 work, you, consisted of excavating, literally digging into the floor of Gavin Brown's enterprise in New York, sculpture as a whole became both a destructive force and absolute spectacle. Variously described as a pit, nest, crater, bunker, and hole in the ground, much was made over the sheer expense of the project and the altogether logistical feat of realizing such a work, interpreted as a kind of provocative anti-art gesture or ultimate critique of the white wall gallery. You also, ble uh, you also notably featured a sign outside warning of physical danger and inherent risk of serious injury or death further underscoring the notion that holes are entities of great potential bodily harm, places we can fall, disappear, and break. My discussion thus far has largely focused on the hostile or hurtful or at least heavy existential qualities of holes in the ground, and maybe this is something I need to talk to my therapist about. But I would like to end today with perhaps more a more positive or at least alternative framework to consider sculptures as holes. Tunnels, valleys, glens, and caves can also be spaces of refuge, of gathering and celebration, of control over underused and overlooked areas. In both the case of Beverly Pe Pepper's Cromlech Glen and Mary Miss's uh, field rotation, for example, depressions are created by building up earth, not simply by taking it away. Mrs. Pavilion structures, particularly those that utilize and manipulate the subterranean to great effect, grant access to new kinds of spaces, holes dug out of the land or pre-existing environments that are often unseen. They offer a different kind of interiority, one that seems less restricted or hidden and more expansive and transformed. The viewer does not experience Mrs. Holes simply by peering down into them or reconciling their boundary lines from afar, but are invited into them as a course of play and exploration. Danger certainly remains, um, and the curator in me is still in awe about how these structures are, are still accessible and, um, and, and up, um, but uh, as it's a sense of awe, but the address of these projects feels different. For all of Mrs. Clandenstein's structures built into the ground below, there usually remains significant visual connection to the sky above, and there are clear points of ingress and egress. Claustrophobia is not the intended effect here. I am always struck in looking at the photograph of her perimeters, pavilions, and decoids made famous in uh, Rosalind Krauss's landmark 1977 essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field, not by the dark gaping chasm of the square hole at its center, but rather of the ladder, so clearly jutting out from its top. 
this small, if also absolutely crucial element of the work, not only reminds me that holes can be profoundly transformative places and metaphors of searching or deep nebulous spaces of mind and matter ripe for mining, but also a natural complement to the principles of sculpture, or perhaps more aptly put, a perfect inversion of sculpture. In sculptures that are holes and holes that are sculpture, the void is no longer used simply as a means to suggest or call attention to the surface or exterior of the object, but rather by using the emptiness of interiority, its immaterial body. Holes can more fully make manifest the materiality of both space and sculpture. Thank you so much. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Yeah, very well. Okay, okay great, thank you. Thank you so much to uh, the organizers of the symposium, the YCBA, especially Rachel for hosting us today, and also to my fellow panelists, and especially to Marin Hassinger for her generosity and assistance in the preparation of this talk. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that floor work and handwork have something in common in that the two share a mutual humility. Within the framework of Western art history, the floor has been associated with the lowness of the daily and the mundane, as well as the body at its basis, all matter, dirt, and dust. Similarly, by 1965, too much hand, and we're in the realm of skill, dexterity, even the feminine, at the expense of the mind and its intellectual pursuits, the drudgery of sweeping that dirt, so to speak. As art historian Alyssa Author has articulated, the issues of technique, mastery, and physical finish became increasingly aligned with the pursuits of the amateur, the Sunday painter, and the housewife alike. This idea was taken up quite literally in the 1960s and 70s with artists using that affinity as license to assert a thorough resistance to modernist aspirations toward transcendence. Artists like Carl Andre, for instance, notably confirmed that resistance through an ostensible allegiance to blue collar standards of value. In this sense, within the framework of minimalism, the use of the floor as a support for sculpture appeared to validate a withdrawal of the hand so that the artwork could consort with the rhetoric and materialism of industry unfettered. To declare an alliance with the floor, a break with those art historical associations that align hand and body appeared necessary to offer a safeguard against the possibility that the floor be seen to share too many of the hand's hallmarks. Their affinity could be acknowledged, but must be kept in check through an ostensibly greater allegiance to the frameworks of conceptualism and the mind. This complementarity of floor and hand was exacerbated should fiber be involved in the work. Fiber was always already aligned with both the dexterous work of the hands and the mundanity of the everyday. Its principally woven form readily forms readily prompt associations with the rote gestures of technique and skill that appeared to preclude thought. This is likely why, with few exceptions, fiber artists in the 50s and 60s rarely placed their work directly on the floor choosing to employ low plinths should the sculpture not hang. In contrast, within sculpture beginning in the mid 60s, such associations increasingly began to fuel a terrain that artists working with hybrid materials, including fiber, began to actively exploit. These artists consciously used the floor in conjunction with handwork to expressly challenge and provoke based on their shared associations. The most well-known of these uh, to explore these affinities is likely Eva Hesse, whose flippant brash sculptures inject certain, certain minimalist tenets with a craft paradigm 
that doubles down on the mutual humility that dogs floor and hand. This paper examines another such case, namely the stakes as laid out by Marin, artist Marin Hassinger when she chose to cross the use of craft and fiber techniques with the dialect of minimalism and post-minimalism. After finishing an undergraduate degree in sculpture at Bennington College, a school at which she had hoped to pursue modern dance, but was instead steered emphatically towards sculpture, Hassinger planned to return home to Los Angeles, where she intended to, to continue to study sculpture. Fresh off of one path change, she was then denied entry into the graduate program in sculpture at UCLA. However, the all new fiber structures department was looking for students and offered her a position. Upon invitation, Hassinger undertook an MFA in the relatively new program, which she completed in 1973. While there, she devised a way to explore those tenets aligned with the all male sculpture department that most interested her while fulfilling her contractual obligations, so to speak, for a degree in fiber. First using fiber, she quickly switched to exclusively using metal in the fabrication of her woven structures. What amounted to a situation, situation of compromise at the time, or rather a situation of marginalization that marks the female black artist of the 1970s came to yield a generative position that Hassinger builds into a 40 plus year career. I'll demonstrate how the ensuing entanglement of fiber and metal charts a conceptual position within a known paradigm, but expands the frame of reference to reach outside the boundaries of the gallery. In other words, where both craft and process art are often aligned with insular medium-based issues, Hassinger sculptures sustain such conversations while also directing the viewer's focus outward to the larger context of the urban environment and landscape from which they issue. Untitled Rope and River are two early instances of this investigation. Materia materials that Hassinger salvaged, these cast off nautical ropes were commonly found in LA junkyards. Overfilled with tar and gunk, they would need to be replaced to guarantee their integrity in the ship's hauling functions that they performed. These compromised loaded materials, which sustain the scale of industry, were effectively woven using various approaches to fiber that relate to amateur off-loom techniques such as macrame. Upon her introduction to fiber in graduate school, Hassinger quickly developed an aversion to the loom and its associations, recently remarking in conversation that, quote, the loom was like carrying a weight on your back. It was awkward, too much to bear. I like doing stuff away from the loom. Some of these techniques are nodding or macrame. Sometimes macrame sounds like an arts and craft technique but I'm not really interested in craft, like craft projects, like lanyards. I'm not interested in that. I'm actually interested in making things that have psychological significance, end quote. Passenger's phrasing acknowledges the pervasive biases of the period. While the shift in scale that she performed aimed to upend the danger run by making allusions to the kinds of amateur craft projects associated with the lanyard, Untitled Rope explicitly operates by establishing a repetitive form that overtly features the macrame knot. Yet despite its highlighted position, the knot here refuses to neatly concede to either a structural or decorative function. Instead, like River does that much more explicitly, the work takes on an environmental scale that initiates a dialogue with the floor and the space of the room. In River, moreover, Hassinger weaves metal chain and cord into the fiber, creating an interplay of surfaces and associations that are all the more far ranging, spanning from those connected with commerce and the river as a trade route to the language of the Middle Passage and the slave trade. 
The results were generative enough to spawn a long-term approach, particularly when Hassinger shifted in her third year of grad work from using fiber to implying wire cord and cable as the materials with which she chose to construct. Like the nautical rope, Hassinger acquired some lengths of steel cable from the salvage yard on Alameda Street in LA and began to see how the material might allow her to approach the framework of minimalist sculpture from a position of handwork. The shift in materials was an important symbolic touchstone for her. Suddenly she was working in metal on the same terms as the boys across the hall, and yet without abandoning her newfound affinity for the tactile intimacy that weaving and knotting allowed her to foster with the materials. No torch needed. Experimentation and adaptation could be prioritized and scale and volume suddenly became all the more boundless. The employment of metal also licensed a newly straightforward exploration of remains, remainders, and leftovers as they related to the LA environment in which she was living. Like the discarded nautical rope, the wire cable came from the everyday realm of labor and ostensibly retained that mundane blue collar status. In conjunction with her experimental gallery, Dedicated to promoting Black artists, curator Linda Good Bryant, along with art historian Marcy Phillips, used their 1978 essay, Contextures, to theorize the bicoastal tendency toward remainders as a strategy that enabled abstract, process driven art to look outside of itself. Whereas, as Good Bryant writes, quote, a complete separation between the properties which define the art object and the properties which define an external object primarily occurs in abstract styles since surrealism, end quote. In the work of African-American artists on both coasts beginning in the late 60s, a combination of an emphasis on process and an emphasis on used remnants brought the work into dialogue with the world through matters of place, culture, and experience. In her first large series constructed out of wire rope, numbers one through five, and you're seeing numbers one through here, three here, this is precisely what Hassinger begins to do. This series originates from the kind of preconceived framework derived from minimalism. Take simple industrial materials and apply, apply a principle to them. Create a series of variations on that principle. Here, the work begins with the construction of regular geometries, either four identically sized squares or four identically sized rectangles, depending on the piece, which are then manipulated so that they sit close to the floor or lift partially off of it. The final works range from the simplicity of number three, which is in the foreground, which creates a fairly discrete bounded negative space in the shape of a square, to the complexity of number two, which is in the middle ground, in which the height and width transform the squares into actively mobilized units that appear to pull away from or resist geometric order. Movement further infuses the series through the treatment of the wire cable's ends. By unplying the tight weave of each using her hands and occasionally small tools like a screwdriver, Hassinger was able to then reweave the wire threads together in order to produce a complete self-sustaining unit. In this way, the squares both hold their geometry and manage to become something else. Like other process works, Hassinger's sculptures are initially based less on matters of style than attention to time and place. Time here tends to correspond to the manifest engendering of making, the duration of a project, the work of construction, the act of cutting, flinging, rolling, balancing, and so on. Place similarly manifests literally, so that the work operates to act upon and define the space that it occupies, conferring an altered identity on it through the interaction. For example, Barry Lavaz's work, as critic Jane Livingston wrote at the time, was seen to convey, quote, the evocation of chaos through its rewriting of the space. That chaos was literal rather than metaphoric. 
And we can talk about how this relates to the talks in the first panel uh, later on. I think there's a great intersection there. Um, similarly, in Emily Wasserman's art forum review of the 1969 Anti-Illusion exhibition, she stretched that quote, a displayed act of execution leaves no room or time for illusionistic effects to intervene, end quote, in turn undermining those conventional conditions of sculpture that allow it to extend beyond the specifics of its current situation. We might call them symbolic. Material stickiness and manifest processual duration interrupt that sculptural logic that might initiate an act of transport or at the very least a capacity for the rhetoric of idealism to envelop the work and place it in a position of autonomy or separateness. In the case of Hassinger's wire rope works, there is undeniably a record of process present and the scale and volumetric format rewrite the gallery as a newly defined and reorganized site. But time and place are externalized and amplified in less literal ways as well. These connect to the framework offered through this conceptualization of contextures. Good Bryant broadly reads these various remainders employed by such diverse artists as David Hammonds, Howardina Pindell, and Senga Nangudi as, quote, imbued with the afterlife of a generative force, end quote, one likely due to the interface between the material's origins and their processual transformation. This has to do partly with the choice to use remnants from everyday life, such as grease, mud, and hair in the case of Hammonds, color chad, colored chads, hair, and string in the case of Pindell, or nylon mesh and sand in the case of Nangudi. Passenger sculptures exert a related force as an aftershock or live wire that still holds a charge as well. The performance of unplying, which affects an unraveling that allows for new subsequent means of weaving, conveys a haptic sensation. The feeling of rending and undoing are coupled with an awareness of explicit entanglement. As suggested above, the visceral effects of that motion appear in turn to incite a charge, so that the work's geometry seeds to something animate or nearly so. Together, the work makes a claim on space in a way that feels somewhat haphazard and conveys allusions to the urban construction site, but in a weirdly dis discomfiting way, as if its remainders had gained animacy, mobilized, or taken up arms. Industrial remnants, castoffs, or waste from a destroyed place transform into the rhetoric of protest or other actions that require planning and group efforts. The charge of the electrified fence or the exclusionary tactics of barbed wire here endowed with the dance-like power of agency and transformation. Forms of entanglement that begin as a literal or physical process here spawns a metaphoric or symbolic outcome. Hassinger's sculptures affect situations of compromise that are compelling in their lack of resolution. Using the floor, they invite complications and snares into the anti-illusionistic tenets of minimalism and post-minimalism and its literal relationship to space. Specifically, these sculptures invite a host of alternate associations through the entanglement of handwork and artifice. Despite the fact that we know they are produced of wire cord and cable, an industrial material used for its tensile strength for rigging, hauling, and other situations that involve heavy lifting, the material immediately announces itself as a substitution, a stand-in for the more natural material of fiber. That substitution affects a connection to the hand and handwork, while also conveying the sense that something is missing, lost, or otherwise depleted in the swap. In such works as these, that depletion amounts to the sculpture as a salvaged remnant that might be collected as a form of testimony, both for what has occurred and for what is possible. Here, the simple gesture of conjoinment 
contained in the intertwined ends of the separate cables yields a new sense of connection, hope, or form of rescue. What I would call this constructive tone is one means by which Hassinger's work strikes a chord with assemblage artists from LA, such as Noah Purifoy and Melvin Edwards, who otherwise work in a different idiom. While the latter two artists provide titles such as Watts Uprising Remains and Cotton Hang Up um, that are more overt in their racial overtones, the three commonly share the abstract language of depletion while advancing a visual rhetoric that encourages narrative and symbolic associations with urban unrest, as well as forms of imaginative transport that look forward to the possible. The hand is crucial in this matrix. Passengers' illusions confuse the language of the street by infusing it with the rhetoric of handwork as invoked by fiber and the performance of weaving. As a result, the cultural weight entailed in the social and geographic conditions associated with the depleted urban, particularly as it breaks down along racialized lines, is countered with some sense of collective force that issues from the hands. And here I'm really thinking principally about her work moving forward. So here's just two quick examples. This is increasingly made explicit in her subsequent projects in which the language of nature is re-envisioned um, here as a series of fiber, rebar, weed remains, or as bundles of branches or reeds. Their slightness seems somehow at odds with the concept of nature that they invoke. In their vulnerability, they sustain a connection to the individual hand and to the very insufficiency it can face in the face of the external forces to which it is subject. Only through the whispers of collective action does a counterpoint emerge that suggests the germinal capacity for some form of future flourishing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I think we're still seeing your screen, Elise. Um, and I'm not sure do we wanna jump for the sake of um, conversation to just the panelist view. Um, but I was struck by, in listening to all of these um, wonderful talks by some of the um, through lines are built, but dealt with kind of differently. So I was thinking about um, this kind of question of extraction ex and excavation, which is kind of latent in Joy, what you, um, spoke about when you talked about the ground becoming a floor, which I thought was a really um, fascinating question to drill into. Um, and I kept thinking about that in relationship, of course, to um, Marin, your um, thinking about negative space and this idea of kind of digging into, right, the, the sculpture that is literally digging into or creating space. Um, and that, that in turn was, kind of front of mind when I, I was thinking about, I love that Sakina piece is one of my favorite works. Um, but when you think about that work, it's quite different in its, um, in its centering of the displacement of material um, than so much of the, the other work that you were describing. And I think to me, there's this interesting connection with the idea of remnants and remains, kind of what we're doing with, um, or what happens to the material that gets, gets discarded or displaced that seems clearly at play, at least in, in your um, in your beautiful talk about Marin's work. Um, so those are just kind of broad themes that I was thinking about. And then of course, there's the age old question of space and time. And of course, those things being kind of intimately related in the way in which, um, Joy, you were sort of thinking about a collapsing of distance, right? That is also, a kind of fundamental marker of distance, right? So the ability, as you described it, to both speak simultaneously across um, enormous temporalities, um, but not to touch. Um, but also, I, I was thinking about it in relationship to Marin. One thing that I um, have often reflected on about Michael Heiser's polls, 
at the Beacon, which I get to spend a lot of time with, and which I should tell everyone, anyone is um, able to schedule a visit to go behind the glass and see them up close. We offer that um, uh, the half an hour to the public, the half an hour before Dia Beacon is open, you can go online. And I, I think it is a really interesting shift that one has when one is behind the glass to see that work. Um, but Michael once said to me that he approached that work by thinking about how digging out and opening up the shapes that he was interested in um, was his attempt at kind of trying to be generous with the form. So actually what happens is you see more of that space, right? Um, which I think is an unusual um, way of thinking about Michael's work. Um, <laughs> but I also think it's kind of interesting in terms of what I think is implied there is the creation of space, right? So he's thinking about how these works open out space. And of course, that is also at play in Long's work, the demarcation of space and um, the Lamelas, wonderful Lamelas piece you were describing, these kinds of markers of place, um, in as much as it is um, in Marin's construction of a kind of choreography of space, a kind of articulation of movement within space. Um, so those were my initial thoughts, and I am not alone in um, thinking about some of these things. So I wanted to start with a question um, that was in the chat um, for Marin, um, particularly. Uh, so this is a question from Michael Tim, Tim, Tim Q, Q. I apologize, Michael, for butchering that. Um, but he writes, I was fascinated by the close look at holes, not least because it drew such thoughtful attention to the sheer variance of holes. One particular issue that struck me was the degree to which the hole is filled with materials. For example, some are entirely absent, consistent with the definition of holes, while others are filled with soil, etc. To what extent does the material within the hole shape your conceptualization of holes and their relationship to the floor or ground more generally? And I think that to me really relates to this idea of what happens to the displaced material, right? That there is always a kind of balance that we have to deal with when we think about this work. Yeah, it was such a great question. I saw that pop up and I'm like, oh yeah, I don't, I can't answer that. <laughs> yeah, no answer. <laughs> Um, I mean, and I think like, I think what it is and, and why I wanted to write this paper, like I don't sit around like thinking about holes all the time, but um, when, when this kind of like symposium popped up, like it really uh, made me start thinking about, like I was just fast, I became fascinated with this topic and I'm not like, I'm not, um, you know, I don't work in physics, I'm not like a scientist, but uh, the more I started kind of like looking into holes, like I swear, like my mind just exploded because that displacement really does become really tricky, right? Because um, space is still something, right? So, so even if there's, uh, even if they're completely empty, not like, you know, Urs Fisher's like complete destruction debris, like leftover remnants of this destruction, but like literally just an open space, you know, that's still occupied by something that's, it's just maybe not matter in the same way we think about it. Um, and I think when you start thinking about holes and start like actually reading science about the, <laughs> the existence of holes, you start thinking like, what where does the hole end and where does where does the 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 container or the skin or boundary of that hole end right um and i think that's the area where uh its relationship to sculpture becomes really interesting because if i'm if i'm sitting here pointing to examples of sculpture that are holes or that function as holes or that use holes it's like what's what's the sculpture what's the object and what's the hole and i and i love <laughs> these projects specifically because they bring to the fore the confusion of that which i actually think is present in most sculpture um, because it is inherently dealing with space and the space around it and in it um, space that we oftentimes can't see or grasp as a holistic entity so um, for me the exercise in thinking about specifically holes in the ground that are worked in a, in a, in a, a sculptural way is that it actually made me think about sculpture completely differently because I don't think that they're, um, whether or not they're filled or unfilled, like that in some ways seems kind of beyond the point in a way that they're, they're, they're all filled. They're just maybe filled with matter we can't see in quite the same way um, or that are doing slightly different things. And, and 
there is just like the psychological implications of like staring into like a Vanta Black, you know, Kapoor hole. Like I find that a very terrifying experience. And like, there's like a really weighty psychological entity to that. Whereas like the Fisher feels very different, right? Or the mist feels very different. So there is, I think a very different, there's a very broad range of, of how, even as Michael was saying, like what's, what holes are and how sculptors are using holes. So yes, not an answer, but. <laughs> no, I think that was a great answer. Um, and I kept thinking about when I was towards the end of your talk about um, that idea of like, the okay, so the construction of the hole, you have to actually make this hole and kind of the skin of the sculpture where it starts. And I kept thinking of Liz Lerner's um, Corner Basher yeah. and kind of like the construction of the hole as the work and the, that kind of relationship to process um, that in some ways, made me think about something, Elise, that you said that I wanted to dig into a little bit more, which was kind of just des describing Marin's work um, through an the abstract language of depletion. Um, and I thought that um, depletion being a very different thing than destruction, but related, right? Um, uh, I thought that was a, a fascinating turn of phrase because in so many ways, Marin's work, I think, is um, Look at that charge that you were describing, like this, that, that kind of energy spark is for me a language of built fulfillment. Like, I think there's so much power in the way that Marin's work animates a space with that charge. So, yeah, I was to talk, just lean into that a little bit more. Sure, thank you. I think you're absolutely right. So, I think there's a kind of contradiction there. And one of the things that, um, was a limitation of time was that I didn't really get to, um, I, I showed those two images at the end, but part of my thinking about this notion of depletion came in part from looking at her work's relationship to nature, which is how it's most commonly discussed. Um, and so it's quite often the case that there's this kind of almost imitation of nature that occurs um, often in within the landscape, she works a lot outdoors. Um, and after really thinking about that work, um, I came, that's sort of when I came to the realization that um, there is a kind of imitation, but more of a substitution and a diminishment. Um, and even though there's a sense in which um, there's a dialogue that is struck, I think, that that's that's meant to be um, often fruitful, um, particularly formally and in the way in which um, the permanence of the sculptures suggests something about the impermanence of nature and the ecological um, catastrophes that Joy was referring to. Um, I do think she's interested in that as well. But I also think that there's something fundamentally urban and in in the sense of um you know the sort of concrete jungle depleted um in the way in which they address the natural form um and so this sometimes becomes most clear when she juxtaposes so she actually uses a lot of sticks and logs um, in conjunction with metal and when that happens um you begin to really see this very strange interplay that um, that gets at, again, at this notion of substitution in another way. I was focusing on fiber because I think that's the first sort of substitution that happens, but then there are these subsequent substitutions which kind of um, pile up and um, sort of create this, um, I think, even greater charge in terms of the way in which they feel um, like uh, emaciated or, or something like that. I'm going to unmute myself to ask this question. Sorry. Um, thank you, Elise. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to turn to another question that we got um, for you, Joy, um, that's in the Q&A um, from Rachel, who, Rachel, thank you so much for everything that you've done to organize this um, symposium. I should have also said that at the beginning um, and to everyone at uh, YCDA. Um, okay. A counterpoint to the argument that Lung's focus on the ground signals an awakening of the planetary um, uh, as a counterpoint. Um, could you comment on the fact that Lung's sculptures, for example, 
quantum clock world would circle, for instance. No, <laughs> no um, surprise that would be the work in question for her. Uh, necessitates extraction. It's also ideally suited to kind of, to global capitalism and being systematic, regularized, and easily transportable around the world. That's such a fascinating kind of reframing of how to think about this work that is so understood to be sort of a part of a grounding experience. Absolutely. Shall I, I come in on that? Yeah, um, that's it's a great question. And um, and I think those things are inextricably connected rather than counterpoint, I would say, um, because I think. Um, and I just to, to say about a kind of signal of an awakening of the planetary. I know Chakrabarti talks about this idea of a cusp of the global and the planetary, but I think um, looking across that range of 50 years of work, I think it's more like a kind of gnawing realization rather than a kind of moment of awakening of, of that um, planetary perspective. And I think that capitalism is inextricably connected with it. I, I couldn't help thinking from that question of a remark from Frederick Jameson that I think has been repeated quite a lot of times about how, how it being easier to imagine you know, the end of the world, easier to imagine that catas catastrophe than it is to imagine an end of capitalism. Um, and you know, I think this that work really speaks to that. And there's a kind of allegory of capitalism in, in Long's work. I mean, straightforwardly, I think with Quantock Wood Circle, that was probably less expensive to um, explore than some of the more heavy stone pieces. <laughs> um, and that made me think about some really early pieces by, by Long, going back to the, the, our very first talk um, about that move into the ground, that some of Long's really early pieces had this idea of simultaneity, of something that could exist in the landscape, so a square in the landscape and then the same in the gallery space and these existing simultaneously and then you have those broadcasts though the first land art exhibition being a television broadcast and in, in a way there's a sense that we have as our reality something that that moment imagined um so you know it also made, made me think actually I felt quite almost like you know Sandra Bullock in Gravity when you were talking <laughs> about black holes you know that sense of that kind of oh sudden awareness of that uh, you know not being subject to gravity or being aware of the fact that the stuff that we inhabit is stuff rather than it being empty space um so I I would say rather than a yeah, rather than an awakening, it's a slow, gradual realization. And rather than being a counterpoint to capitalism, I would say that it's almost like a, you know, this is an allegorical um, mode of capitalism. And Long's criticism of of the sort of large scale um, work like Michael Heiser's was that it was ultimate capitalist art, but his is nonetheless capitalist art. It's just part of a different. And it's part of the same system of distribution. So yeah, that's only to begin to answer the question. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that entanglement, I mean, this is just such a fantastic panel and I just, uh, I'm just bursting to think of things to, to, to say. So thank you. I also just wanted to add into with the, with the mention of, you know, like the, the televising of, of Land Art, the, the Keith Arnett, project was also um part of that right and how that you know we see it today in a gallery and like that nice grid of those images being put on but it was actually first broadcast on german television as part of the you know the land art project and but without any like sort of mediation yeah. every once in a while just one of those images would flash up without totally. like any sort of <laughs> understanding of what this what like no like I just no. can't imagine having to like make sense of that. And then like, if you were watching it over the whole course of the run that you would eventually start to connect the fact that he's being, that he's burying himself. And then like what that ends up doing, you know, like it's just, it's a, it's a bananas project. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. It, it, yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, a, and, and it's like a, yeah, because it's like a coder to the land art project, but as you say, it's just this idea of interrupting the broadcast day. And of course, that's also similar to the way that people experienced the land, you know, the moon landings, that it was something that um, in its live broadcast was like that. It brought it was sort of interrupting into the regular 
programming because the exact moment of it wasn't wasn't fully known so yeah I mean yeah and I just to say one other thing about the the Keith Arnott thing that I remember when we were looking at the photographs really closely was trying to work out whether you could still just about see his head in the very last picture or, or whether he had just completely disappeared into the earth thank you um Joy, I think you just brought up so many interesting things to talk about and I've often thought about how, for example, the the um, explosion of commercial jet flight, right, like totally changes the relationship to how people experience the landscape and that's happening at the same time that in the United States you have the construction of the interstate and defense highway system. So there's a kind of experience of vision in motion that is totally unlike anything that we've had as humans prior to that, right? And the relationship between kind of points of focus um, and points of abstraction in relationship to that, that I think um, is really tied up in how these projects end up getting articulated. Um, from Pepe to Elise. Hi, Pepe Coma. Nice to see you. Hope the best for him. Um, in Hassinger's Steel Bodies series, currently on view at Socrates Sculpture Park, she shifts from metal fiber to steel tubing. The worst still rest on the ground. What do you think is the significance of that kind of material shift? It's a really great question. And I'm completely taken with those works, um, but I haven't seen them in person and I haven't thought about them yet. Um, and I know that they um, are in dialogue with works that she did in the gallery which are um, really different also in that they use fabric um, in some of them and they do, they do still use some cable in some, um, but I don't know. And I haven't had the opportunity to ask her about that yet. Um, the forms, I mean, the, the question of the vessel is a whole other, um, issue that she seems to only very recently be introducing into the work um, that strikes me as very much related to ideas that she's been thinking about, but is, is really quite a new um, take. And so I wonder if it's not the case that, um, that the, the sort of conversation around the vessel called for a slightly different material um, because uh, the reason she uses cable, I think, for so long is because she's interested in this act of unplying and suggesting this notion of weaving and suggesting the way in which those um, ends either form connections or expand out into the world. And the vessel's form doesn't really relate to that in the same way. In the one in which she uses um, that type of material in a vessel shape in the gallery, it becomes a decorative um, feature of the surface. It's really amazing. It looks um, at that one, it, it mimics textiles um, and looks um, incredibly tactile and, and, and compelling. And it's a very big work. Um, but I think that I, I mean, it, it looks sort of like a, a domestic work that might have looked weird in the sculpture park. Um, but yeah, I'd love any any thoughts that you have as well. Thank you. I'm really into the speaking on mute today. Uh, we have another question in the chat that I um, think is really important to address. So intriguing comments on issues of violence and cutting, but also care and reparation. Um, could you comment on any of the thoughts you may have on the kind of gendered occupation of natural spaces? I think, Marin, for you, for example, with the Mendieta work, I mean, I think, it's probably gonna be a main question, right? Yeah, very different. But at the same time, I mean, I think there's, I was interested, Joy, that you you had those Nancy no, Holtz images, agreed. which I love. Um, she's an amazing photographer. Um, her use of the camera is really interesting, which goes out west in the United States as well. Um, and there's a kind of tenderness to the Grave series. Um, it's always fascinated me, but I digress. But anyway, I think, yeah, I think everybody could take that in one way or another on this thing. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll keep it brief, but uh, I, I'm always like really hesitant just to be like, yes, there's totally a gendered thing and women do it this way. And you know, like I just, uh, I, it's not, that's not my style, but I do, it did strike me in looking at just like the kind of random selections of, of case studies that I showed today. Um, the kind of, uh, again, the, the, the address, um, that the works had, um, did fall differently on gender lines. And I think even, uh, you know, I think that there's something that can be inviting but still dangerous and still violent um but there the, i think the the way in which um access uh is granted or withheld actually is a really significant thing um especially uh and and it's also different right if you're, if you're like you're looking at a whole in person versus like something that's mediated which is something we we didn't really have time to discuss but another kind of interesting point of like how the the more kind of phenomenological experience is, is oftentimes mediated through something else right so looking at photographs of, of richard long's work versus looking at Marin hassinger's pieces in a gallery is going to get this different kind of you know that's just a different orientation um but it, it does strike me um and and i know there's some really amazing work uh, forthcoming on on um, uh, women land artists, um, and I think that there there um, there is a difference. As much as I want to be like, let's just take it on a case by case basis. I do think that um, an engagement with the land uh, is and in, in calling attention to that uh, that there has been different approaches. Do we still have a any time, Alexis? I was um, panicking because I forget what time we are supposed to <laughs> end at. <laughs> I think we're over time. I think we're over. Okay, so and so. um, thank you all so much for the those thoughts and for your um, really really insightful papers. It's been a pleasure, and I guess we'll see you all in the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Alexis. Bye. Hi, thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome back. Thanks for being here. My name is Maureen Theodore, and I'm the Associate Curator of Programs at the Yale University Art Gallery, which is just across the road from the Yale Center for British Art, and where one can right now find a stunning installation of Richard Long's Quantock Wood Circle. I want to thank my colleagues at the Center for organizing this day, for engaging with Richard Long's work, and for inviting me to chair this panel. I'm delighted to be joined by three colleagues who will explore the topic of sculptural dialogues. As with the other panels, after I introduce our three speakers, they will each present for about 20 minutes. At the conclusion of their presentations, we will we four will have a conversation and you all, our audience members are invited to submit questions via the Q&A function and we will address as many as we can. And you're welcome to send in your question whenever you like. I'll begin with Jonathan Vernon, who is Associate Lecturer at the Courteau Institute of Art, London. In 2020-21, Jonathan was a Leonard A. Lauder postdoctoral fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York where he worked towards a book project examining the cultural politics of the sculptural fragment in the 20th century. Last year, he was a visiting research fellow at the Henry Moore Institute Leeds, where he conducted research for an exhibition exploring the Brancusi paradigm in British sculpture of the 1960s. His research has also been supported by the Terra Foundation for American Art. Jonathan was awarded his PhD at the Courteau in 2019, and served as the Writing House Contributing Editor at the Burlington Magazine in 2014 to 2017. His latest publication, an article for the Sculptural Journal, tells the story of how Brancusi's sculpture became a tool of Cold War cultural diplomacy, and we'll hear a little bit more about that today. John J. Curley is Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art and Rubin Faculty Fellow at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He is also a Paul Mellon Center Mid-Career Fellow for 2022-23. He has published widely on post-war American and European art, including a 21 article in art history on the connections between the paintings of Morris Lewis and Cold War cultures of rationality. 
He is the author of A Conspiracy of Images, Andy Warhol, Gerhard Richter, and The Art of the Cold War from Yale University Press of 2013, and Global Art in the Cold War appearing in 2019, uh, Lawrence King. He is currently at work on a long essay on Anthony Caro and a new book, book project provisionally titled Critical Distance, Black American Artists in Europe, 1958 to 68. Mathilde Guidelli is the Associate Curator at the Art Foundation and a PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center, where she specializes in art, media, and architecture of early, early 20th century Europe. At DIA, she has curated exhibitions of work by Leslie Hewitt, Jill Maggett, Mario Mertz, Sangha Nagudi, and Jack Witten, among others. As the organizer of Dia's Artists on Artist Lecture Series, which is a program that I personally am a big fan of, she has commissioned performative talks by a number of artists, including Olga Balema, who we'll hear about today, Arya Dean, Dwayne Linklater, Naeem Mohaiman, Precious, o o sorry, Precious Okoyomon, I hope I have that correct, Marina Rosenfeld, and Tiffany Shaw. Prior to joining Dia, Guidelli served as curator and researcher at international institutions, including the Musée du Louvre, the Museum of Modern Art, and she's taught courses in art history and architectural history at City College and Hunter College, New York. She resides in New York. Thank you, Jonathan, John, and Mathilde, and thanks to our audience for their engagement. And Jonathan, I am going to invite you to start us off. Thank you, Meline, for that very kind introduction and for chairing this session today. Um, I'd also like to thank, get this bar out of the way. I'd also like to thank Rachel Stratton, Jen Oakley, and everyone else at the Yale Centre for British Art um, for organising this symposium and all the speakers. I think the level's been um, exceptionally high and it's been a really productive day already. Um, apologies also, just before I begin, I am currently battling a cold, Joy was right, it is freezing in the UK at the moment. <clears throat> in the spring of 1989, the Museum of Modern Art New York hosted a one-room display of sculptures by Constantin Brancusi, drawn chiefly from its own collections. The display was selected and curated by the American artist Scott Burton, best known at this time for his large-scale furniture sculptures which appeared in public urban spaces across the United States. The exhibition was in several ways, the first. It was the first in a series of artists' choice exhibitions at MoMA, which is still running to this day. It was the first artist's intervention in the collections display of a major American museum. The National Gallery in London had set the example with its annual artist's eye exhibitions beginning in the 1970s. And it was curator Kirk Varnado's first exhibition as director of the Department of Painting and Sculpture, having just taken over from William Rubin. Alongside the Brancusi display in the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Sculpture Garden were several of Burton's furniture sculptures. These works combined a constructivist attitude to the, re the relationship between form and function with a post-minimalist concern for the conditions in which the art object addressed its viewer. Burton aspired to a sculpture that, in his words, placed itself not in front of, but around, behind, underneath, literally, the audience. And the strongest forerunner of this project for Burton was Brancusi. There were clear precedents for Burton's work in the furniture Brancusi crafted for his studio home in Montparnasse, or the Table of Silence, part of his monumental sculptural ensemble at Pilgudu in Romania. But what Burton saw in Brancusi, he saw at every level of his practice, as a way of knowing and experiencing and acting upon the world, an ontology inscribed in a language of form. And the key terms in this language were Brancusi's faces and pedestals, the objects that mediated between the replete, gleaming other world of the sculptures in our world, the wasteland of reality, the floor. Burton's display at MoMA was at root a visual argument for this reading of Brancusi's work. The limestone pedestal of fish and the oak base of the sorceress were exhibited in the absence of their sculptures, the former emphatically vacant at the room's center and the latter lifted onto a plinth of its own. <clears throat> 
Conversely, the sculpture newborn was placed directly on the floor, or rather a raised section of the floor. The other objects were displayed more conventionally, but each took on a different highly charged character when set between the inverted polarities of newborn and the pedestals. The oak endless column of 1918 pointed back to its source in earlier bases, and quite suddenly, the flat plane at the head of the sculpture, where its repeated geometries ab abruptly terminate, appeared empty. Any sense of a categorical separation, much less a hierarchy, in the construction of Adam and Eve, Chimera, Passerea Maestra, and Young Bird, dissolved just as quickly. Three weeks after the exhibition opened, the verdict of the art press was clear. From the conservative reactions, Burton wrote to Varnado, I now realize that you stuck your neck out a bit. Burton was savaged, and most of the attacks centered on his subversion of a naturalized, if not simply natural, order. He had committed an act of narcissism and violation, calling forth a slew of bodily metaphors, more than one critic called it a dismemberment. His furniture sculptures were non-art. Above all, he represented a disturbing symptom of MoMA's decline from a bastion of establishment modernism to a fashion house where a new generation of curators embraced what the critics said was an unacademic way of looking at art. It should be no surprise that Hilton Kramer's review of the exhibition articulated most clearly and vociferously the point where these lines of attack converged. The exhibition represented, he said, part of a campaign to transform MoMA into a postmodernist museum, an attempt to portray Brancusi as a sort of honorary patron saint for the postmodernist enterprise, and a particularly gruesome example of the kind of aesthetic vandalism that the postmodernist project entails. The result of these efforts, he said, was the creation of an ex-Brancusi, a dismembered Brancusi, a Brancusi stripped of its reason to exist. It is, in short, a postmodernist Brancusi, which is no Brancusi at all." End quote. This paper is not especially interested in adjudicating the validity of Burton's claims about Brancusi, but I recognize that we need at least some word on their viability if we are to fully grasp both Burton's intentions for the display and the hysteria he provoked. Certainly, the arrangement of objects in Brancusi's studio was provisional. The sculptures and bases coupled and decoupled with relative freedom, and the boundaries between art object, furniture, and architecture were evidently permeable. As a document of these shifts, the sculptor's photographs recalled the endless composition and revision of a living as well as lived text. The fact is that the meanings of Brancusi's art that are available to us have been produced by a dialectic between these figures, between this figure of difference, reflexiveness and transience, and another defined instead by purity, autonomy and hierarchy. Which of these figures we might prefer to invoke is less important than why, in this moment, we choose to invoke them or to lash out against them with all our might. That is the question we must ask of Scott Burton because it's the question that will lead us to an understanding of what kind of agent, what field of signification, the floor in Gallery 23 was for those few months in 1989. In doing so, it is vital we first recognize that this floor has a highly specific material existence of its own. I don't want to gloss over the inconvenience of those platforms never quite functioning as either floors or plinths, to the structure of the world Burton wanted to build within the exhibition's four walls. Nor do I wish to ignore, though it's difficult to really see in black and white, the grey carpeting that covers the surface area of both the floor and the platforms. At once drawing them together and in its motel lobby materiality, marking an absolute distance between them and the polished wood, stone and bronze above. The exhibition records are not definitive, but it seems apparent that the platforms and the perspex vitrine containing newborn were conditions forced upon the display by conservation concerns. The carpet was a means of drawing them at least visually closer to the gallery floor. For precisely this reason, I think the platforms render visible 
the horizon of possibility that had closed around the modernist paradigm Burton wished to resuscitate by 1989. They mark an impassable distance that had been opened up between the musealized, fetishized object and the ephemerality and directness of performance and conceptualism that the century grew old. The significance of that distance to Burton's project will become clear as we progress. Back in February, Burton had written to Jean-Hubert Martin, director of the Musée National d'Art Moderne in Paris, to request the loan of either a version of Brancusi's cup or vase. Burton told Martin that these sculptures, paired with the base of the sorceress, would form the essence of his show, and it is not difficult to imagine why. More than anything else in Brancusi's body of work, cup and vase give form to the taxonomic margins between sculpture and object. As Burton put it, they are representations of functional objects, caught like the bases between the acts of meaning and being, the positions of signifier and signified. If one of those two sculptures were displayed alongside the base of the sorceress, Burton explained, in one glance, the audience, sophisticated or not, would see that here are two related sculptures, two sculptures of things. Burton imagined that this experience would have a profound effect on his audience, one that gets to the very heart of what Brancusi could signify in this moment. He wrote to Martin, this alone would help immensely in the creation of a whole new generation of Brancusi lovers here and even in Europe where the questioning of the nature of the art object is also intense today. Tatlin cannot be our model, for we do not live in a politically revolutionary society at this moment. Brancusi is our model, and the cups and vase, like the arches and benches, embody this contemporaneity. The passage is rich, dense, and surprising. When I first read it, the mention of Tatlin and the concept of a politically revolutionary society lashed out from the page like a shiv. I don't know of any text that sets out quite so explicitly the precise terms of the bargain made by Western modernism with the histories of the avant-garde in the latter half of the 20th century. Burton cuts to the core of what any number of post-war American artists had to say about tackling the constructivist idea and its world-making impulse. They said that constructivism could only ever give us the fragments of an imagined future, that it could only survive as an aesthetic, that utopianism and loss were braided together, that the last best hope for a late capitalist avant-garde to retain some purchase on the social world was constructive art of radically limited scope, one scaled to the individual, the domestic, the lived spaces of modern life, an art that could be part of the furniture. The history of political disappointment and creative compromise that lay behind this vision was also part of Scott Burton's history. In the late 60s and the 70s, he had been a performance artist at the vanguard of gay liberation and the peace movement. During the same period, he was on the staff of Art News and then Art in America. And in 1969, he wrote the catalog essay for the landmark conceptualist exhibition, Live in Your Head, When Attitudes Become Form. Both as an artist and as a writer, he had helped to formulate the critical language of post-minimalism, especially in moving beyond minimalism's sometimes prescriptive universalizing mode of address to one that made space for difference. In a representative lecture of 1973, he said that performance was sculpture as theater. It turned upon the artist's creation of a transactional or situational relation with the viewer, articulating their position and agency within a social structure. For more than two decades, in other words, Burton had belonged to a world of theory and practice animated by the curious kind of utopianism identified by Lucy Lippard and John Chandler back in 1967. He had seen its proliferation. He had seen its struggle to hollow out a space apart from the systematic institutional commodification of the art object. Above all, he had seen its repeated attempts to negotiate the terms of the modernist paradigm, and that included the nascent minimalist tendency to identify the oblique, impassive thingness of the minimal object 
with both Brancusi and Tutlin. What those two figures had represented in the moment of minimalism's break with modernist orthodoxy was a non-objective art that staked out space and collapsed the imagined boundaries between art and life. An art held in tension with the floor, the wall, the whole unseen scaffolding of human experience. For all that has passed since, for all that nostalgia and disappointment, Burton's Brancusi was still this Brancusi. In his words, Brancusi, the first minimalist. And he retained the hope that what it stood for could still resonate in the face of approaching millennium. His catalog for the display at MoMA, he told Martin, could become a key item in Brancusi studies of our age, the age of furniture art, the age of a new public art, and the possibility of a social art to which Brancusi is so relevant. If the floor signified for Burton the social, he would have nonetheless understood that this post-minimalist Brancusi had a complex relationship with another paradigm, one that would identify the floor more closely with the land. In April, the month his exhibition opened, Burton was interviewed on Radio Europa Libra, the Romanian language channel of the US government-backed network Radio Free Europe. By that December, Radio Europa Libra would provide the soundtrack to the Romanian Revolution, amplifying the tremors of civil unrest over a two-week period that ended with the executions of Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu. Burton's interview was broadcast alongside programmes with titles such as Some Reflections on the Attempts to Embellish the Image of N. Ceausescu, and Each U.S. First Lady Has Her Own Personal Style. And like these programmes, the interview was conducted as a dispatch from another place, from the West and from a culture defined by a plurality of perspectives. Burton argued that there are many Brancusis, and his interviewer pointed out that these included the Brancusi of minimalist artists and the Brancusi of abstract artists. My Brancusi, Burton explained, is the architecture and the furniture and the artist who is interested in all forms of plastic creations. How Burton's Brancusi would have signified in Romania in this time is a complex question. Burton's desublimation of the base did not just resonate with the minimalist Brancusi. In promoting a form of craft that reconnected Brancusi sculpture with lived experience, it also resonated with a discourse that had long secured his place within Romanian national consciousness. This discourse saw Brancusi's work as an extension of a wood carving tradition kept alive over centuries by the Roma Romanian peasantry. It had resurfaced with particular force in the years after Brancusi's death in 1957, especially as an instrument of the nationalist cultural politics that legitimated successive regimes, including Ceausescu's, as the Socialist Republic sought to establish its independence from Moscow. And along with Brancusi's large direct carvings in wood, the direct allusions to Romanian mythology, and the wisdom of the earth, the key terms of this discourse were the bases. Romanian publications repeatedly illustrated their decorative schemes and geometric idioms alongside the architecture and applied arts of Brancusi's native region, Altenia. Artists released from the strictures of, stru of socialist realism in the 1960s took the same cues. Understood, as a sign of continuity between the present and an ancient past, the artifice of human culture and a permanent natural state, the base was fundamental to Brancusi's position in the image world of communist Romania. It rooted his modernity within localized folk traditions, the Romanian soil, and the ethnic, cultural, and moral purity of the peasants who worked it. Of course, Burton's interview would have comfortably met the remit of Radio Free Europe and its emphasis on plurality and the emphatically rootless cosmopolitan figure presented by the Brancusis of American modernism. That these interpretations persisted outside the structures of a national ideology would have at least hinted that the values of groundedness and purity had another side in stasis and isolation. 
but Burton's Brancusi was nonetheless a negotiation of the Romanian literature, just as it was a negotiation of American minimalism. He researched a large number of Romanian publications for the exhibition. In the catalog, he cited documentary evidence of Brancusi's education at the Craiova School of Arts and Crafts, and noted the resonance of the Table of Silence with the Maso Joasa, literally a low table that occupied the center of peasant cottages in the region. Above all, he credited Brancusi with the invention for our century of four earthworks, installation art, and public art of sculpture as place, end quote. What was consistent in Burton's negotiation of these parallel pasts was a rejection of the prescriptive, the absolute, the essential, anything that could not survive contact with the floor and its lived and felt reality. I suspect that many of us would instinctively respond to Burton's furniture sculpture today with a dash of contempt. We might initially overlook it altogether as little more than a growth on an architectural body, part of the givenness, the thereness of the built environment. If we were to look beyond these surfaces, we might see Brank Burton's public sculpture as an extension of the corporate landscape, a lobby seeping into the street, the kind of landscaping that swallows bodegas and community spaces, a floor that spreads and paves over old boundaries from Bushwick to Bethnal Green. Burton playfully described himself as a lunch artist, a Matisse for the neoliberal age, not making easel paintings for the businessman in his armchair, but making what we'll do for an armchair in our narrowing slivers of leisure time. It's a bleak picture of what it means to settle for Brancusi as a model. But closer scrutiny of what furniture really meant for Burton should give us pause. When he described his performances as sculpture as theatre, he was not just talking about the aestheticized body. He was talking about the conjunction of the body with furniture, a structural condition of his performance work that persisted throughout his career. The inversions of subjectivity and objecthood enacted in these works speak to an erotics of everyday experience, an attempt to represent how desiring minds and bodies relate to one another in the world. In particular, they channel Burton's experiences of living as an out gay man, and in the late 1980s, living with HIV. David Getsey provides an affecting portrait of the 1986 sculpture, Two Part Chair, comprised of two granite pieces joined together in an allusion to anal sex, and produced by Burton as the effects of HIV on his body had begun to intensify. Alone, Getsey says, neither of these elements would be as structurally sound as a chair. Both rely on each other, locked in a reciprocal, reciprocal grip. If separated, the two parts would fall to the ground, be unrecognizable as figures, and become useless as furniture. Together, these two near identical elements keep each other vital in their endless moment of accord. It is only that interdependence that allows this work to be strong enough to offer itself to us. Should we agree and back onto the chair, we can too feel the sculpture's enduring performance of support. I don't want to say that Burton was just queering Brancusi by bringing him down to the floor and drawing out the play of categories and hierarchies that structured his work. But I do want to express the astonishment I felt in revisiting my first attempts to write up this material as a straight man and seeing that the term queering didn't even appear, which was a personal failure of scholarship and of honoring those things we owe to one another when we tell stories about history. What the display at MoMA did was to make vivid the belonging of Brancusi's sculptures to the spaces we share as bodies, subjects and objects the spaces where we construct and realize ourselves in our specificity, subjectivity, and difference. This understanding has clear implications for how we interpret the responses of Burton's critics, especially in their persistent evocations of a body violently undone and their obsession with postmodernism, a figure of difference that still finds its uses in culture wars to this day. While Burton on Brancusi was still on view, the Maplethorpe retrospective perfect moment was canceled 
and became the subject of a culture war that led to an obscenity trial. Hilton Kramer asked, is everything and anything to be permitted in the name of art? Mablethorpe died of AIDS in March. Burton followed him on the 29th of December, aged 50. They, they joined 5,335 people who died of AIDS in New York City in 1989 alone. The words of lived experience don't quite seem right anymore. Better perhaps to say that the floor was life. Thank you. Can you all see that? I don't want to zoom. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. First of all, thanks to the organizers at the Yale Center for British Art, um, as well as Moline for chairing this panel from across the, across the street. I also want to give a thanks to the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, they provided me with, with an advanced PDF copy of a book that was published just this week, um, edited by um, Eric Booker on the Smokehouse Associates. So it's vital and you know, this paper would have been impossible without that, uh, without that publication. So I encourage you to seek out that book um, uh, for yourself. And also, this, this too is um, a picture of the book. Let me get it. Um, also, I think this, uh, this mentioned this is a project really much um, in its uh, very plenary phase. So um, I'm looking forward to any uh, feedback afterwards. <clears throat> in this photograph from around 1969, modernist sculptures are on display in an abandoned lot in Harlem located along 3rd Avenue between 120th and 121st Street. In these additional archival photographs, we see close-up views of two of the works and see they share clear, share clear affinities with the work of Don Caro. The dominant form of the Don Caro sculpture positions them as autonomous objects that aspire to some kind of abstract communication or other disembodied experiences. Something different is going on in Harlem. These objects become sites of the embodied and interactive play of children. These are modernist objects that display aspects of postmodern engagement and contingency. The paper already is working very well, I think, with Jonathan's paper just a moment ago. These images document some of the work of the Smokehouse Associates, a collective mainly comprised, comprised of the artists William T. Williams, Melvin Edwards, and Guy Charka. Smokehouse primarily, primarily created abstract wall paintings in abandoned lots in Harlem that demonstrated their belief in the transformative and democratizing power of public abstract art. But in this one space, John, John, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Your audio is not coming through clearly for everyone. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if you could try it without your video on. Maybe we would hear you more clearly. Can we just do a little bit of a sound check? Sure, I'm in at work. I'm surprised that the Wi Fi is um, down. Let me see. Um, okay. So should I back up or? Um, um, I'm just going to try it. You can enter off the chat me if it's bad still. I'm still not hearing you clearly. Um, I think I'll do the next one on microphone. Let me take the microphone off. It worked, it worked fine yesterday. Um, okay, now I'm, I'm I'm using the microphone now. I'm sorry, I didn't have that set in on my mic. Oh, my... perfect. That's, so that's super good. That's, that's great. I want to invite you to restart so we can hear okay. every word of your presentation. I'm, I'm so sorry. No I. Uh, okay, I'm going to start the video. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, well, I thank everyone. And also, I want to mention the publication of this book from the uh, Studio Museum in Harlem that just was published this week. Uh, it was granted access from uh, via P a PDF um, edited by Eric Booker, a really great source for me um, for this paper. Okay. In this photograph from around 1969, modernist sculptures are on display in an abandoned lot in Harlem, located along 3rd Avenue between 120th and 121st Streets. In these additional archival photographs, we can see close-up views of two of the works and see that they clear, share clear affinities with the work of Anthony Caro. The dominant formless line of Caro's sculptures positioned them as autonomous objects that aspired to some kind of abstract communication or other disembodied experiences. Something different is going on in Harlem. These objects become sites for the embodied and interactive play of children. They are modernist objects that display aspects of postmodern engagement and contingency. And I mentioned how um, these uh, already we see affinities with Jonathan's paper from just a moment ago. 
These images document some of the work of the Smokehouse Associates, a collective mainly comprising the artists William T. Williams, Melvin Edwards, and Guy Charka. Smokehouse primarily created abstract wall paintings in abandoned lots in Harlem that demonstrated their belief in the transformative and democratizing power of public abstract art. But in this one space, Edward added these added these added abstract sculptures into the mix, but still credited them to the collective as a whole. In my talk today, I want to think about Edwards' smokehouse objects from, from 1969, alongside similar works by Caro from the first half of the, of the 1960s. Both artists weld steel elements together, paint the objects a bright color, and display the finished sculpture without a pedestal on the floor or ground. Furthermore, both Smokehouse and Caro rely upon ideas of composition, not the repetitive and serial practices of, minimalist, of the minimalists, and they all, both often showed their work with painters. While differences are also clear, the formal affinities between Edwards's Smokehouse work and Caro's classic painted steel sculptures merits investigation. While Edwards has denied the influence of Caro, I nevertheless want to think about the Smokehouse sculptures as something like inadvertent cover versions of Caro's work. I'm not thinking about covers in a pejorative sense, but rather in the ways that artists like Otis Redding and Nina Simone and others recorded the songs of the Beatles and Rolling Stones in the late 1960s. One reason was to repossess symbolically these modern British bands, whose enormous international success was significantly dependent upon precedence of Black American music. Such an approach, thinking about art alongside popular music, is one way to escape the hermetic and white world of modernist interpretation. As numerous scholars have pointed out, you know, a grounded understanding of Black American art should explore its interactions with popular cultures like music and film. Along these lines, the Smokehouse sculptures might function similarly to those musical cover versions. They redeploy Caro's modernist forms in order to interrogate and reframe the complex histories of the 20th century avant-garde, especially in forcing viewers to reconsider the racial implications of high American, high American modernism and the way these same forms might be considered liberatory in this new public context in Harlem. And let me be clear, I am not suggesting that, that the Smokehouse sculptures are in any way subservient to Caro's. On the contrary, I'm suggesting they can provide a way to reconfigure or liberate modernist forms from the white supremacist legacy of European and American modernism, pointing to ways to reimagine post-war abstraction as an engaged model of, your, of urban politics. Smokehouse Associates have formed in 1968 when William T. Williams and Melvin Edwards discovered a mutual interest in democratizing the arts, including modernist forms of abstraction. The name came from the ways that in the American South, Smokehouses provided the continued sustenance of meat to communities during hard times. The Smokehouse Associates are best known for working in partnership with the Harlem community to make abstract and geometric wall paintings in public spaces as a kind of visual sustenance. The collective, view, the collective viewed public abstraction, according to the uh, curator Eric Booker in his this important new book I just mentioned, as, quote, vehicles of change, unquote. They believe that wall paintings could transform the behavior of, in, of inhabitants and transform the nature of the neighborhood. In addition, community involvement, sorry, um, sorry. In addition, community involvement was central to Smokehouse's concerns. The artists hire local individuals, including kids, to clear the lots and paint walls. In terms of the sculptures, uh, Edward, Edwards welded and painted them on site, outside, in front of, and with help from the community. Edwards embodied this community ethos towards abstraction in a project he executed in, a, in predominantly black South Minneapolis in July, 1968. Here he worked at the, at the Sabathani Community Center with community members to make sculptures that, that ended up resembling Caro's work, which were then displayed outdoors in one of the Walker Art Center's first outdoor exhibitions of sculpture. While only a few archival images exist, one shows a woman standing on a sculpture, thus suggesting a more interactive conception of modernist forms just before Edwards made, made objects for, uh, for the Smokehouse Associates. As I mentioned earlier, Edwards adamantly denies Caro's influence. It is certainly true that Edwards began welding steel with no influence from Caro, as examples from his long running Lynch fragment series begin, begun in 1963 are not freestanding or painted. For his painted steel sculptures, Edwards claims George Sugarman as his influence, who made his first floor bound work in wood in 1953 and began painting his sculptures in the mid 1960s. That said, Edwards would have definitely seen Caro's sculpture Titan when it was on view in the Jewish Museum's you know, famous primary structures exhibition in 1966, 
as Edwards was there to help install a friend's work. You could have also seen the same work Titan at a show with Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan at the Metropolitan Museum in 1968. I'm not interested in establishing a definitive narrative of influence, but rather in exploring the implications of Caro's and Edwards' formal affinities to arrive at a more expansive understanding of 1960s modernism. Cover versions of songs have, have, have long been a productive way to think about art artistic production and race in America. The first song that Elvis Presley recorded in, in his rock and roll style was a cover of black bluesman Arthur Crudup's That's All Right Mama. For cultural historian Eric Lott, quote, Presley's not quite and yet not white absorption of black style was inevitably indebted to a musical tradition of racial impersonation, unquote. Or to put it another way, uh, the, men's, the, the minstrelsy tradition. For Lott, Pre Presley practices a kind of blackface performance without a literal change in appearance. As music, music scholars have noted, cover versions are complex cultural texts. Sheldon Schiffer suggests that a cover version, quote, can function to some degree like a, like a historian, unquote. While Michael, Michael Awkward argues that some cover versions perform the function of, quote, practical criticism, unquote, allowing artists to, quote, reimagine, create, or, and develop their own artistic personae, unquote. These formulations, and indeed the word cover itself, Recall how Craig Owens discusses allegorical appropriation in his influential account of postmodernism in 1980. Owens writes, the allegorist does not re restore an original meaning that may have been lost or obscured. Rather, she adds another meaning to the image. If she adds, however, she does so only to replace, unquote. A good cover version like Elvis's That's All Right Mama, or as I discussed below, the Beatles' Twist and Shout, aims to replace the original, to paste over it, or to cover it. Many of the bands associated with the so-called British invasion of the mid 1960s, most notably, most notably the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, also established the bedrock of their sound on the music of black America. The Stones, named after a Muddy Waters song, exclusively played covers of American blues numbers in their early years, while the Beatles in their formative period made covers by Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Ray Charles, and others the focal point of their live sets in Liverpool and Hamburg. Indeed, the Beatles' debut album, Please Please Me, is bookended by Black American models, both attributed, attributed and not. The Lena McCartney original, and put that in quotes, I saw her standing there, sees Paul lift the nearly exact bass line, uncredited, from Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You, while the album closes with the group's iconic take on the Isley Brothers' Twist and Shout. In between, they cover songs by Arthur Alexander, The Cookies, and two by The Shirelles. Paul's even discussed uh, perfecting his Little Richard quote unquote impersonation in the, late 19, in the late 1950s, which is one of the reasons John asked him to join the Beatles. The Beatles were never shy about revealing, revealing their love and deep respect for Black American music. But as Black arts movement founder Leroy Jones, later uh, Amiri uh, <clears throat> Baraka argued in 1966, this does not mean that this attitude skirts centuries of white supremacy. Jones provocatively and convincingly asks, what is, diff what is different between Beatles, Stones, et cetera, and minstrelsy? Minstrels never convinced anybody, anybody they were black either, unquote. Jones even talks about the ways that white artists admit things like, quote, I got everything I know from Chuck Berry, unquote, but they never add the unspoken, quote, but I got all the dough, unquote. While not the focus of his essay cited above, Jones also discusses the political power of black cover versions of originals by white artists. He highlights the ways that Stevie Wonder's 1966 cover, uh, ver cover version of Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind changes the original's quote, abstract and luxury playing, unquote, into something, quote, that is actual in the world, unquote. Wonder's version transforms Dylan's song about generalized cultural change into something specifically about black justice and civil rights. Just after Jones writes this essay in 1966, scores of black artists, mostly soul singers, began covering the Stones and Beatles. Otis Redding, Otis Redding himself covered the Stones Satisfaction and the Beatles Day Tripper to name just one artist. The cover versions can function as quote, practical criticism, unquote. Black recording artists in the age of black power wanted to rec recoup the Beatles sound as their own perhaps a way of staking their own retrospective claim to the group's sound. One of the most powerful cover versions in this tradition is Nina Simone's Revolution, 
released as a single in 1969, just a few months after the Beatles released their original version with the same title as the B-side to Hey Jude. Even though Simone lifts the original song's basic tune and lyrical signposts, she does not credit Lennon and McCartney as songwriters. Instead, she takes credit for herself and her band leader, Weldon Irvine. If the original song is a fast-paced number with, with a distorted and raw guitar sound that, com that comes out of the American Delta blues tradition, Simone reclaims the tune with her own passionate delivery, filtering the Beatles through gospel, jazz, and blues influences, as well as her own piano training in the Western classical tradition. As you'll hear in these two snippets, she also changes the tenor and political thrust of the lyrics. So I'm gonna play the two snippets of both songs. First, you'll hear um, the Beatles, a bit of the Beatles' revolution. As you heard, Simone changes the ambivalence of, quote, if you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out, unquote, to, quote, I'm here to tell you about destruction, of all the evil that will have to end, unquote. She takes the privileged speech of four, British, uh, four white British rock stars, ambivalent about their involvement in the process of revolutionary social change, into a Black power anthem about the necessity for violence as a way toward Black autonomy and liberation. Incidentally, her performance of Revolution at the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969 is only blocks away from the Smokehouse sculptures. And here's the crux of my paper. Can one draw a parallel between Simone's cover version of the Beatles and the Smokehouse sculptures that clearly resemble Anthony Caro's work from the early 1960s? If Simone interrogates, reclaims, and recasts the Beatles original, what might this say about the sculptures Mel Melvin Edwards made for public display in Harlem as part of the Smokehouse Associates? For one, if modernist innovation in the 20th century relied upon models provided by African art and other so-called quote-unquote primitive models, with two examples here suggesting ways that Picasso was inspired by African art, then might the smokehouse sculptures also be reclaiming modernist forms? Do their objects then transform formal modernist exercises into something, quote, that is actual in the world, unquote, to return to Leroy Jones's formulation about Stevie Wonder's blowing in the wind? Before we delve further into, into Smokehouse's sculptural objects, it might help us to think about the still dominant high modernist reception of Caro's steel sculpture. Michael Fried, for instance, viewed a sculpture like Early One Morning as participating in a kind of abstract utopian communication with the viewer. Fried closed a 1963 essay on the artist saying, quote, in Caro's more successful sculptures, one discovers the elusive syntax of our own purest and more passionate gestures used to construct gestures even more pure and passionate, unquote. Freed sees, sculpture, Freed sees Caro's work as distilled gesture that can, in artistic form, approximate ways to transcend the usual limits of human communication. Furthermore, for Freed, Caro's painted steel sculptures appeal to vision, not to the active body of the viewer. Lastly, they are cast as the fulfillment of sculptural innovations in Western modernism instigated by Rodin, Picasso, Brancusi, as we just heard, Moore, and David Smith. As such, even though Caro's works were on the floor, like the minimal art of Donald Judd and Carl Andre, they were not, to reference Freed's most famous essay, Art and Objecthood, sites for theatricality and the embodied experience of, for gallery visitors. Early one morning resides in our space, pedestal free, but still reads, at least to Michael Fried, as alien to everyday life. In some ways, the pedestal is implicit in Caro's floor-bound work. Despite common materials, the object still reads as something like high art, especially when viewed in, the, in a white cube gallery or other refined museum space. 
The smokehouse sculptures demonstrate what happens when modernist forms are placed in contingent sites in Harlem. When liberated from the white cubes so associated with notions of aesthetic and indeed racial purity, these car-like objects can realize their radical potential for play and a more direct model of sociability that materializes Freed's notion of abstract communication. To kids not versed in the nuances of sculptural development since the earliest 20th century, an abstract sculpture without a pedestal can approach the condition of playground equipment as we see in these images. A playful logic of, of abstraction was not lost on the Smokehouse associates themselves as they wrote in materials supporting a grant application, writing, quote, it should be understood that we are not creating a playground or attempting to manufacture prototypes for recreation spaces. We are not relinquishing our assumed roles as artists, but attempt to broaden its Western definition, unquote. A couple of important things here. First, they define their urban spaces as lingering between, <clears throat> between playground and, and an art gallery. And second, they want to expand the notion of modernism beyond its quote, Western definition, unquote. Here, bringing its, form, uh, its forms into the lived spaces of the city. As part of the same grant application, they write that they want their visitors to experience each of their projects as a quote, post-religious event devoid of utilitarian purpose, unquote. In other words, these public sites would constitute art-like experiences outside of everyday existence, but would not necessarily be read as such by viewers. This kind of experience recalls Walter Benjamin's notion of distraction as a powerful aesthetic mode. In the work of art essay from 1935, he posits how modernism could battle the oppressive forces of fascism and suggests how the mass distraction of film opposed to the singular concentration required by a painting provides a model for developing a revolutionary consciousness. To appreciate uh, early one morning in Tate Britain, for example, depends upon a belief in, or at least a recognition of artistic autonomy. The smokehouse sculptures can only achieve their transformational aims in distraction in a mode that is the antithesis of capitalist bourgeois aesthetics. If art is viewed as separate from life, the belief goes, then how can it intervene into that life? In the brilliant exhibition catalog, Parapolitics from, 19, from 2020, which concerns the, inter, the international institutionalization of American modernism in the post-war period, the editors ask a vital question in the introduction. They write, quote, how could it be that the autonomy of art was regarded as its historical achievement rather than as a central problem of art in the bourgeois economy, the problem that prompted the emergence of historical avant-garde, unquote. In other words, shouldn't the autonomy associated with Caro's modernist reception be seen as a repudiation, not the fulfillment of the historical avant-garde? In this way, might we see Caro's work as coming to represent by the late 1960s, the conservative values of the so-called silent majority? In some ways, Edward Smokehouse sculptures return modernist forms to radical social purpose. I see the Smokehouse sculptures as revisiting the ethos of Elizitsky's 1920 painted sign in the Soviet Union. And again, going back to Jonathan's talk, I think Tatlin could stand in here as well. With its combination of text with, with Malevich-like abstraction, the public sign attempted to use radical artistic form for the radical purposes of reimagining a world outside of capitalist and imperialist structures. May we say the same for Smokehouse, as well as, as, well as, as, well as how Nina Simone used the pop modernism of the Beatles? Smokehouse's radical ideas about public sculpture tap into these utopian origins of modernism at, this, at the precise moment, 1969, when those dreams were increasingly being exposed as nightmares. I see Edwards' sculptures here as reclaiming the utopian aspects of modernism from Caro, like Nina Simone reclaiming and recalibrating the Beatles' modern pop sound for Black America. Edwards and the Smokehouse Associates used modernist abstraction against itself, reclaiming its liberatory possibilities in the face of exclusion. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, let me, uh, before diving in, I wish to thank, and as I open my PowerPoint, I wish to thank um, the organizer of this productive symposium, my fellow panelists, as well as the audience who is listening. So one second. Okay. So my paper today is a close reading of a recent work by the New York-based sculptor Olga Valema, titled Computer, that was realized in New York during the pandemic in view of an exhibition at the Camden Art Center in London that finally occurred last summer. 
I think uh, formal intelligence is the first and foremost attribute of Balema sculptures, which uniquely triangulate historical memory, our mediated present, and the politics of place. So provoked by the formal characters of the work, uh, my paper today moves quite a bit across time and space, private and public, real and virtual. So thank you for bearing with me. Okay, here it goes. At the time of my writing, Olga Balema's computer is in progress. Fragmentary impressions build up through subsequent visit with the artist during winter 2021. A scale model of the gallery at Camden Art Center, computer's final destination, offers a counterpoint to our New York locales, just as the sense of another place evoked by the work overlaps with its situated material conditions. This is therefore an exercise in reversal. I look at computer and I am transported to a secluded garden with a pond somewhere in it, landlocked yet vibrant. Upon the blue water, yellow ginkgo leaves swirl in my prismatic daydream. At once concrete and abstract, all surface and absolutely generic, the vision is bottomless in space and time and I get lost in it. From fin de siècle prints to mass produced rugs, this patterned surrogate of nature assuages the stresses of urban living ever since architecture and industry first joined forces in Victorian times, when the areas around Camden Art Center were developed. My wherewithal dries up and I come to a standstill. A plastic billboard is displaced. The medium of publicity in its habitual use, the plastic tapestry is soon or otherwise firmly secured high up on a metal frame or on facades of buildings for rent. Avoiding being confused with the message, the same material now stretches horizontally on the art gallery's parquet. It mimics a rug and displays pictures of a rug but their derivative pixelation precludes sensual plenitude. Within and outside the studio, a range of operations distresses the once homogeneous surface, endowing it with haptic qualities. Everything is generated balancing outside elements and an involved editing process. JPEGs of prismatic daydream rug are shared with a professional science printer to be rendered in a loose array. The redundancy of the grid signals the interplay of different registers, the fibers of the plastic, of the printed rugs, their distribution, the pixels. The essential qualities of the work are now built into the synthetic fabric, offering something useful to edit from, rub into, cut through, splay open, stick together again. Exceeding the surface of the artist studio, Occasionally, the cumbersome work is rolled up and dragged onto various New York streets where more scuffing and frottage of the rough geometric sidewalks are generated. If the white plastic expanse recalls backlit touch screens, a motley of square incisions brings back the ancient technology of computer keys. Taped fragments now lie astray upon its surface as if the result of a glitched reproduction process. Through these repetitive operations, the total shape of the sculpture stays the same, yet its topology changes, disrupting the ratio of positive and negative space, figure and ground, opening up more room for more traces to accumulate. The sculpture is a place. It cannot be seen in its entirety from a single point, yet to walk on it is to soil it. We tread on it carefully, weighing whether to skirt its blue areas or rather to dive in them. As such, computer lends itself to a different way of being inhabited. It demands that we consider our position on the work and by extension in the institution that hosts it. To the private promise of comfort offered by the pleasant image follows the public discomfort from sidestepping visiting protocols and impacting form making. Is the object the locus of vulnerability or does it mirror ours? The work's relativity to sight its openness to incidental qualities and the anonymity of something approaching a found object are characteristics that computer shares with earlier work by Balema. Consider the styrofoam and tape constructions that Balema presented at, the New, York, at New York's 2019 Whitney Biennial, leaf and floor that we see here, 
one stretch thin from the ceiling all the way down to open in a pinched oval shape that grazed the floor. The other doubled the side where wall and floor meet, all the while making it weird. Brick-like wall material lined up on the floor while Foterrazzo carpeted the wall. The anise was yours if you paid attention, but you risked altering the work's tenuous balance by getting too close. The disturbance is mutual, and what is natural in a museum space after all? A sense of reciprocal threat is similarly present in Banema's water sculptures, a series that she began in 2013. Shells of soft, hot sealed PVC that contain pop plastics, metal scraps, or other materials submerged in water. Turgid and on the brink of bursting, they contain indigestible leftovers and remake themselves over time. The tint of the water changes as the, object release, as the objects release oxides or other artificial coloring. The affinity with cellular organisms of the water sculptures is displaced in brain damage that we see here, in the exclusive choice of material, a garment quality elastic band that typically fits the shape of the body while leaving a mark on our skins. Whereas the water sculptures reproduce themselves, brain damage was open to reconfiguration due to an inherent iterability. Partially painted and half-heartedly tucked together, the elastics slouched on the gallery floor while grafting on the lower portion of its wall, alternating moments of tension with ripples of slackness as if presenting the dispersed effects of the titular injury. For Balema, the physical and psychological character of the gallery is a starting point. The relationship and proportions between parts is another. As such, her sculptures enter in dialogue with site responsive artistic practices of the 60s and 70s, as we heard, that is, as we heard today, uh, works that presented a reciprocity between the body of the sculpture and the cultural space that surrounds it. To parse similarities and difference with that earlier sculptural vocabulary is to highlight the specificity of Balema's formulations. And I borrow this term from Griselda Pollock's work on Is Against Ken. One can see a fleeting game of quotation at play in Balema's work, articulated through an attentiveness to form, materials, and processes of making. The distributed composition of brain damage, for one, calls to mind very leves horizontally dispersed sculptures, while its acrylic dipped elastics recall the colored acrylic yarns that Fred Sandbach strung floor to ceiling or wall to wall. Whereas leves dispersions present us with the aftermath of a violent action in their forensic stillness, and Sandbach yarns bring the space alive by creating shimmering virtual planes. Balema's elastics are still going if burned out, as if caught in the act of trying. The mastery over chance at play in Leve, or the experience of calmness elicited by Sandbach's perceptual focus, moreover, are unsettled by Balema's activation of our perimeral, peripheral vision in her work. In brain damage, the latitude of perceptual field, in addition to the somatic connotation of its primary material, combine to blur the distinction between viewed object and viewing subject. Balema's floor and leaf recall another paradigmatic work of minimalist sculpture, Carl Andres Lever from 1966, wherein fire bricks constitute the basic unit of a floor bound sculpture. Andre led the bricks edge to edge to form a line that projects from the wall and cuts the gallery space altering its proportions and our movements in the process. In floor and leaf, Balema similarly employed bricks as the primary unit to intervene in the museum space. Yet unlike lever, the constitutive elements of floor and leaf only bear a resemblance to bricks and avoid adding up to one singular axis. Instead, they are shaped from a lightweight synthetic material and taped to approximate alignments. The elemented elemental certainty of lever is but a memory, and Balema's biomorphic additions further deviate from Andre's rigorous module, just as the applied patterns and textures are superfluous to structure per se, but essential to hold things together. Quote, one thing after another was a way to escape from setting up relations, end quote, 
goes the canonic account of minimalist sculpture and Rosalind Krauss's uh, in her 1977 uh, passages in modern sculpture. The opposite is true in Balema's works, where everything is relational, internally and externally. Under sculptural syntax, in its structural affinity to discrete measurable units of labor time, deliberately align the artist with blue collar workers, as most recently Julia Bryan Wilson has documented. Composed of unassimilable, unassimilable leftovers, self remaking over time, and alluding to fallen vegetation or other forms of biological exhaustion in their titles. Balema sculptures direct us instead to a different framework, and I'm alluding here to the framework of world ecology and reproductive labor in general. The vital forces of nature, traditionally presented as external to, yet available for, an all-consuming capitalist value system, are revealed as tied in a web of relations that constantly reshape one another in Balema's work. Interiors becoming exteriors becoming interiors, the artist once said of her work. At Camden, computer operates in the space between the formal present of the work and the historical contradictions of the size that hosts it through the trope of the Jardin d'eau. By choosing the image of a rug with yellow ginkgo leaves on blue water, printing it multiple times at varying degrees of pixelation upon billboard material, and rendering it dry and dirty and horizontal, Balema seems to be testing the enduring validity, the enduring validity of a shared fantasy. The trope is never near. It brings me back to another Jardin d'eau, Claude Bonnet's and his famous and his most famous water lily series, painted over almost three decades between 1897 and 1926. The series comprises some 300 canvases of varying sizes depicting water lilies and other accidents upon the surface of a secluded pond, the impressionist own property in Giverny, France. In spite of Monet's oft quoted statement, one instant, one aspect of nature contains it all, there is in fact very little nature here. Everything begins with the circulation of a marketable image of Japan following the opening of trade routes with England and France in, 18, in the 1850s. Nature is engineered to mirror that image. And I really drew here from the work of uh, Catherine Wells and what she calls Imperial Mimesis looking at this moment in the mid 19th century, following the aptly named unequal treatises between Western nations and Japan. Paintings were made that in their final monumental format cut across, sorry, Monet purchased lotuses and water lilies seen at the Paris World Fair of 1899 to be disposed upon his artificial water garden, the result of innovative hydraulics and landscaping techniques. And here are some of the documentations of Monet's ordering water lilies. Paintings were made that in their final monumental format cut across art, architecture, and decoration to submerge the viewer. Nature at Giverny today continues to be upkept to mirror the paintings. So in a feedback loop. The water lilies are not even actually rooted, we learn, but potted in floating vases. Monet gradually moved his workstation atop his so-called Japanese bridge to take horizontal views of the aquatic life. From that vantage, the works dispense with Western conventions of landscape painting. There is no repoussoir. And the viewer is immersed. <laughs> this is Monet. And the viewer is immersed in a disoriented field of unmixed swaths of color. The boundaries of the subject are less distinct in the process. And this is the orangerie where the late water lilies were finally installed after Monet offered them to the French government. After World War II, they were finally installed. After World War I, they were finally installed in 1927. A blind spot in literature on Victorian visual culture is the link between the transformation of nature from the novel scale of capitalist noxiousness and its surrogate reappearance in secluded urban gardens and domestic interiors via patterned screens, wallpaper, tapestries, and costumes 
and their various relations to the body of workers living in increasingly smaller, less affordable, and more unlivable dwellings. It is a successful image to these days, as prisma prismatic daydream rug attests. It is still marketable because it promises affluence. It is nice, evocative, enveloping, all white productively disorienting. Rather than eliciting traumatic returns, however, computer brings up on a trip that shifts our social and conceptual grounding. Like the late water lilies, Balemas is a hybrid artwork that produces its own geography. Yet neither aura nor spectacle, two categories that fit Monet's works, apply here. Our experience of computer unspools in time, oscillating between the plenitude elicited by the image of nature, the prismatic daydream with which we began, and the terse materiality of the sculpture, which drains us out. Even if momentarily we let ourselves be transported by the power of the image, from exhausted to succulent, from the pressure of urban life to an all enveloping experience. A malaise ensues. Computers recline this position, distributed field, and surface distress brings us back to our situated bodies. The elicited experience, as always in Balema, is durational but non narrative, made of contradicting, reconfigurable registers, mapping blanks, ponds of blue, blurring ginkgo, flowing pixels. What makes a mass-produced object yours is your dirt, the artist tells me. What draws affect into form is a matter of concern, I hear her saying. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. Jonathan and John, I'll ask you to um, come on screen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for those beautiful papers. Jonathan, I loved the line about Burton talking about my brand koozie in that in a way we're all making an artist or installation ours by engaging with it, or at least that's how I heard it. And then there's a way in which, John, when you talk about covers, I was thinking of like Wilson Pickett's Hey Jude, for example, he's making that song his. And Mathilde, um, you end by talking about making something yours. And you talked a lot about the kind of immersive nature of um, Balema's work. I work, um, my academic background is in uh, art of the 1960s and 70s, and specifically artists like Long, who reimagined the spaces and temporality of art with an ambulatory viewer and a pretty patient one. Um, but my work in museum programs and uh, public education, I, there I think a lot about audience. Um, so for me, the center's installation of Long's work and this day gives us a chance to look at the projects you presented through the lens of his work and contributions. And one of the things I'm thinking about is, is audience, like the role of the viewer in these projects. He writes about, or Long writes about walking as medium. And I'm wondering how um, these works together with the spaces of, or the space of a gallery or a museum implicate the viewer as a maker or a participant in the sense of partaking in walking as medium or uh, moving around a sculpture. And I'm not sure if you've had the pleasure to see the long work or experience the long work in um, the center's galleries, um, but they're, uh, well, I hope you have. Um, so we heard about site responsiveness from Mathilde where the work responds to or absorbs something of its site. And there's this reciprocal relationship between the body of the sculpture and the sculptural space. Um, we certainly see that at the center with Long's work where it seems in dialogue with the con cylindrical staircase and also the pastoral wooded scenes, um, painted scenes around it. But where I wonder if you each could talk about, and maybe we could start with you, Mathilde, um, where you where the viewer figures into your your project, and how you think kind of about work like this generally in the viewer. Yeah, I mean that's a very interesting question. Of course, um, yeah, starting with Long, the work pins you in motion, obviously, um, because you want to, even if you can grasp it, you still want to kind of observe it as you circle around it. And 
the work from kind of in this kind of horrible situation going back in time, like the first moment of going where um, Balema's work brought me was obviously the moment of the 60s and 70s and thinking of very leve because of its um, dispersions and Sandbach. And obviously in that case, um, you know, Sandbach famously spoke about the pedestrian space um, and taking as, you know, part of his generation uh, and Long's generation too, thinking about taking the work and placing it at the same space of the viewer. So off the pedestal into the real space of the gallery, you can cross a sandbag plane and it's always thrilling, but at the same time, you don't affect for making. So neither of these strategies of the sixties uh, and seventies and really the viewer is not really given to affect for making. And then we get into like the work that Jonathan, you presented to me was, you know, if, if one wants to really strip down the kind of, to the bare minimum, the difference is that you can sit, you cannot sit on a Brancusi uh, pedestal, in, but instead, um, yeah, you can sit on Burton's work. But, um, and then to move, but you still will not alter its shape. And somehow something that is interesting for me that has been interesting for me of encountering Olga, Olga's work is the precarity of the form that she presents. There's a kind of affinity, material affinity with the body because of the use of these synthetic materials and uh, somehow the slight, um, what would I say? How would I define it? Um, uh, imperfect edges of her works that are often, you know, barely kept together and computer uh as i saw it you know developing because of the situation in which olga could not work make could not travel to make the work in london because of lockdown and so she was in new york and i could see it evolving over win the, that winter and the first time i saw it unfolded in actually her new york gallery because it was the only space where actually there would be enough room where to actually <laughs> unfold the full work. Um, that became interesting uh, in terms of how much your movement on the sculpture affects the form. And again, it's it's not obviously we've seen today other works in which the viewer can work, but the the wideness of the billboard and the kind of level of any any movement you make smudges it. So it's like, sh shall I do it or not? And at the same time, there are these tones of blue in which you are, they're incredibly seductive. You feel like you want to dive in. So it's a very interesting conundrum. And obviously the moment it is then placed in the gallery, you are so hyper aware of how educated we are not to touch artworks, how hyper aware we are in terms of like, uh, you know, behaving in a certain way in institutions. And at the same time, um, here you are, um, with this kind of allusions to nature, but nothing is natural in, in this uh, constellation. So yeah, a kind of a long-winded answer, So, Can I jump in on that? Because I thought that was excellent, Matilde, and, and um, really distilled quite a lot. So we started today, which as I said, I think has been a brilliant symposium. And one of the reasons it's been so brilliant, it's not just the standard of papers, but that there is a problem field that has emerged quite naturally from all of them. Um, which is not just the floor, but I think it was articulated by Pepe in the very first paper, which is the relationship between phenomenological and symbolic space. Um, and to that end, a thing that I could not fit in my paper because um, of time constraints, but I feel is almost like a missing critical term that could act as an umbrella for, for everything we've seen today in some respects. Um, is the, the things that someone like Amelia Jones has to say about the Michael Fried paradigm of opticality. Um, in, in, the, in the case of Scott Burton, as you say, Mathilde, you can't sit on the Brancusi and that is a problem. And the platforms where it's never quite on the floor are a problem. And there is a, 
an element to that kind of spectatorship that still requires the optical dimension. Um, so it, it really, it really holds the first. It is phenomenological, I think, in the, in that frame. It holds things in tension. And what Jones has to say about the kind of holding operation that Michael Fried's criticism, um, it could be argued, represents that it's you know part part of that tradition going back to Kant of um, optical disembodied and fundamentally disinterested looking, um, a looking that's divested of of the political and of and of a sense of being in the world. And the way that she contrasts that with what's happening in minimalism and post minimalism and like fu fundamentally the flaw as I sort of try to get across in the paper, I think is an agent of difference. And I think that's one of the things that's come across really strongly. Um, and it's certainly there in all, all three of our papers and certainly in John's where, um, you know, I've done, I'm trying to find a way to pass it over to Jay. Um, but I, I like, you know, it, it, the, the urban environment, the idea of a, a public art that is, um, that is, you know, riffing on, on the themes of someone like Caro that transplanted into an urban environment. Um, I just thought it was fascinating and framed so. I can just sort of jump in too, and like I thought there's you know, a lot of great overlap between our papers. And for me, uh, Moline, your question really gets to ideas of like what the, you know, the museum viewer in the late 60s in New York City was, a, was an incredibly political figure. You know, with the Metropolitan Museum's exhibition Harlem, Harlem on My Mind, which was, you know, lambasted by, you know, by black artists and black activists, as well as many other activists as, you know, you know, a white curator, not really actually showing any art <laughs> in the exhibition besides photography um, of James Van Der Zee, um, you know, this, this led to the formation of, the, you know, the Black Emergency, Black, <clears throat> black Emergency uh, Cultural Coalition. You know, which protested the Metropolitan, you know, led, leads to an exhibition from of Mel, Melvin Edwards at the Whitney Museum in 1970, where he shows barbed wire. This goes back to Elise's you know, discussion about, um, about, about, about Marin Hassinger's sort of very frayed and sort of threatening sculptures. But the way that Melvin Edwards himself was thinking at the Whitney show by using barbed wire about referring to minimalist forms, but also sort of talking about the exclusionary, you know, the nature of sort of high modernist forms. And I think it's really interesting, you know, you know, you know that that um, that that then the Smokehouse Associates decided to address their works to you know to the non-museum going audience uh, as a way. And I love that quote. And there's more quotes from William T. Williams about the idea of trying to get modernism away from you know the museum, trying to get away from the you know from the academic ideas of modernism. And I think it's really interesting how like those sculptures themselves, when liberated from Friedian and Greenbergian criticism, they are they're not necessarily about optical experience at all. And so I think what Smokehouse has done for me is helped me to understand, you know, ways that, you know, the high modernism is, is kind of just one sort of small story about the sculpture. And there are many other stories to tell. And we've just been, you know, at least me as a, you know, as, um, as a white art historian trained in, you know, trained in the Northeast, like I am very, you know, I was blinded by Greenberg and Fried and sort of, you know, Krauss's responses to all this. So getting out of that discourse and finding, the other ways these sculptures signify has been, you know, I think especially important for formulating new, you know, new, uh, more inclusive histories of modernism. Thank you. I'm going to invite the audience to send questions via the Q and A panel, and um, we have time for more. So please do send your questions. Um, in. I have a question here for John, and this is a continuation of um, what you were just talking about from Michael Timke. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Toward the, he, This is what he, uh, he writes. Towards the end of your talk, when referring to freed you productively, if implicitly, turn his notion of anthropomorphism on its head, since you ask us to think about how the sighting of objects with visual similarities may address the bodies of audiences differently and do so in ways that may push us to think about issues of race. Against this background, in what ways do you think Smokehouse's sculptures radicalize how we think about the interrelationships between race, the ground, and sculpture during what you describe as modernist utopianism of the moment and the previous few decades? Well, it's a great question. As I said at the very start, this is very preliminary for me, so I'll do my best to kind of give some some indications to that, but I need a lot, do a lot more thinking to kind of fully answer that. Um, but as I just mentioned, I think Caro's sculpture itself, like, you know, doesn't have to be modernist. So there's a way to sort of think about those sort of sculptures without Freed. And, 
in previous work, and actually Jonathan and I were in a panel in September at the Henry Moore Foundation, so it's kind of funny that we're back on this panel. Um, but I talked about Caro's work um, and the ways that early on he was friends with members of the independent group. Uh, Nigel Henderson took photographs of his sculptures. Uh, Allison and Peter Smithson, the architects, um, designed, you know, re re sort of refitted his studio and his house. And so already in Caro's work, you have sort of a strain or a sort of a counter narrative of his engagement and interested in the quote unquote as found of new brutalism. Um, and so I've done some research along those lines. So I think. Um, that kind of provides some sort of way there. But kind of getting to the real the meat of your question, I think too, and I'm trying to do more research on that actual lot in Harlem where those sculptures were shown. And I haven't had a chance to go to the archives and find out what was there before the smokehouse. But there's something there about urban transformation I think is really interesting. And I know the Third Avenue High Line or Third Avenue Elevated Subway was there mm -hmm. right in front of that lot until 1953 or 54 when it was torn down. And so the idea of urban change and transformation, how these sculptures perhaps posit some kind of symbolic mode for what, what architecture could look like or what, how it could be interactive and engage the community in productive ways. Um, there's one essay in that new book I keep talking about um, that the Studio Museum in Harlem just, just published, an essay by, um, by Charles Davis that compares Smokehouse to Archigram, um, you know, the British architect architectural sort of collective. And, um, who are thinking about architecture in new public and social ways and interesting sort of, um, sort of you know, very ways that can bring, you know, equality and equity, you know, and, you know to, uh, to sort of architectural space. So I think the answer to your question is really about that those sort of, you know, sort of trying to find ways to bring those kind of ideas in. I hope that gives some sort of semblance to how I'm thinking about that. Jonathan, I wanted to ask you another question um, about your paper. Um, and I was really fascinated by that. I love the Artist on Artist series, but I was not aware that um, Burton's was the first. Um, and I wondered, I, uh, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the criticism of, of the project. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Mm. Sure. I mean, it wasn't um, for the sort of purposes of the paper and, and the narrative and the neatness. I just covered the negative responses. There were a few very well judged critical pieces that understood exactly what it was doing that called it subversive, that said, you know, this really works because by 1989, the audience has like minimalist trained eyes um, and, and they, they know what's being said about these objects. Um, two reviews in particular by Peter Sheldar and Jack Flam. So you're talking about, you know, that people really understand this stuff um but there was the, the broadly it was it was criticized um in the postmodernist terms that i in the the sort of anti-postmodernist reactionary terms that i set out in the paper um and i think it's important to flag up that when i began um researching Brian Cousy, but it was always couched within a, a a sort of Cold War framing, not an entirely mm -hmm. binary one, but seeking to understand what happened after his death and exactly what was what kind of um, scene was constructed in Romania in particular. And what, what I didn't understand that early on um, was just how fundamental he was. And I think it's true that almost as early as there has been a, a museum culture in the United States, Brancusi has been there to stand for a certain idea of modernist form, whether in a, a controversial way or not, from the Armory show, the Burden Space thing, um, the trial in 1928, and then you know the, the collections of, of John Quinn and Catherine Dreyer and all those Americans who sort of collect his work in a way that doesn't really happen anywhere else um, in the world. He is, he is very visible, which is why he become part of why he becomes so important to those minimalists in the 60s. And you know, it, those collections in the Guggenheim and in Philadelphia, they're already visible um, by the mid-1950s. So audiences and, and critics had an idea of what these sculptures represented. They had an idea of their place within a, a modernist tradi tradition that, um, in some quarters was still sort of vivid and something that needed to be defended, um, I think, in 89. Um, yeah, it's, um, 
is a, a compelling case, oh, I should also say, of um, what can happen when you just go into an archive when you're, especially when you're young and you don't really know what you're looking for, because um, it's a it's a wonderful archive that they have there at that moment that's within exhibition records um, and collects all that stuff together. That image of the, um, I, I am forgetting what the name of the sculpture is, but the just the head um, of the Brancusi work like on the ground mm. is, um, it, I had to stop myself from actually feeling like that was a, um, a violation. Um, really? That's it seems so precarious. And uh, Matilda, you're shaking your head. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of Sherry Levine. Like I'm thinking of the newborn. You know, yes. that was, I mean, as you were saying, obviously, Brancusi was so central um, and is still remains, obviously. But yeah, that gesture of kind of placing, even worse, a woman making a copy of Brancusi and placing it on the, on the, directly on the floor. I mean, that, that actually, really Sherry would use pedestals, but yes. And the kind of like height there, I think it's surrounded by two works that are quite a bit high. It just, um, I, I will admit, I found it jarring. I'm, I'm um, very interested to hear those perspectives just to just to close from museum because I am I'm mostly an art historian. I don't work directly with objects. Um, and it's fascinating to hear that that can still have a, a kind of tension because in, in the studio, something like the newborn was just placed on a surface, not necessarily directly on the floor. Uh, there was like a satin cushion that I think they, they tried to reconstruct for the Burton on Brancusi exhibition and just just couldn't because they you know um but there, there was a, a cushion that Brancusi had made um that this thing sat on so so the, the the conditions of spectatorship for a work like that were were as sort of um provisional as as Burton was suggesting that's really interesting yeah I mean part of my perspective is as someone who works with students and groups in a museum. So I'm very aware of um, how you would safely gather around um, works and at the art gallery and often at the center, works are not under um, a bonnet or um, it they are unprotected in a way. So it's very much, I'm thinking about how people interact with them. And I don't know if you've been to the center, but when you enter the space where the long is installed, there's a sign that says, look down, work is on the floor. Um, just reminding you that, um, or it seems to signal that things are a little different here. We have a question from Rachel Stratton in the chat, who is one of the um, terrific organizers of this day. So I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, all three papers really productively explored a breaking open of modernism in Matilde's through the parallel with Monet, in Jay's through a racial reclamation, reclamation of Caro's modernist language, and in John's through a queering of Brancusi's. I guess I'm wondering what it is about modernism that we somehow can never quite escape. We so often treat it as this ground zero on which artists of the late 20th and early 21st centuries build. This is a gigantic question for the end of the day, but I'm just wondering if anyone has thoughts or comments about why that is and whether our articulation of quote unquote modernist language is in fact a bit of a straw man, straw woman. Totally fine. Oh, sorry, that's the question. I'm, I think we're getting toward that question anyway. So I would love to hear uh, your reflections on it. So I'll something really, really quickly. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. I never thought about it as such, but I guess so much of my work is dependent upon the sort of this, this straw person, as we say. But for me, I think that um, modernism, you know, even though even with the emergence of postmodernism and all the sort of the question of it, still rules our world. At least still rules like sort of the capitalist bourgeois world. I went to Marfa some years ago, and it's just sort of this, you know, although you know Judd was a minimalist and showed works on the floor, and it was about contingency and bodily experience. It still, nevertheless, becomes like this sort of you know Judd expands out into this migrant community, you know, farming, agrarian community, rural community, and modernism takes over that, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that town. And I don't know, and like the gentrification, the real estate, like all these sort of things, you know, and modernism is a very exclusionary language. And I guess for me, that's what's so important about it. While we have discredited it in these sort of forms here and we question it and we think about alternatives and other counter readings, but it still has such a, you know, such a stranglehold I believe on like on our mentality and you know museums are still trying to struggle with how to show art that isn't 
the white cube that isn't sort of predicated upon this Kantian idea of disinterest, disinterestedness. That's such a hard word to say. Um, but, you know, so that's my initial thought to this. But I think it's, uh, we need to probe that, you know, uh, probe that question more. I think my interest in going back to Monet, um, which um, was really in thinking about, or what the work, you know, it, it was really prompted by the form of Balema's work, thinking about the trope of an image and where that image comes from and what that trope um, of a market, marketable image comes from. So in that sense, uh, and how marketable image of nature specifically, uh, and a marketable image of nature that appears as, you know, I it was a bit cheeky obviously, but like showing the screenshot of the fact that you can buy that image for $15 today. And it, it is basically the same image that you would have on screens in the 1890s, uh, except it is a digital image rather than um, uh, screen painted screen or printed screen. Um, so I guess this is a kind of a preface to say that to me, what was interesting in going back to that modern is thinking about modernism in, in historical terms and the con what, what gave form to modernism is the conjunction of, you know, modern engineering and technology, the, cir the circulation of images, treatises, uh, kind of like a, a, a predecessor to this, in uh, circulation, as well as um, uh, mimesis, if you want, which is something that happens a lot in Balema's work. One of the essays that, of course, um, is very important to any student of modernism is the Roger Caillois on uh, mimesis and psychasthenia, which, of course, uh, brings about all this kind of psychological space that uh, Balema's work, I think, really does. Um, the work brain damage that I showed as at this specific um, discomfort that you feel entering a contemporary art gallery, this kind of, and it's like literally burnout. And he uses the garment that is sold in Chinatown, where the uh, and that comes, you know, uh, from global circles of commerce, and that is there. So somehow it's kind of looking at the genealogy of those larger historical conjuncture and that larger historical conjuncture is what gave birth to modernism as well as Monet's famous Giverny garden and his Jardin d'eau and um, it was irresistible um, not to go back to that moment but I guess again to me the interest is the structural long duration of certain kind of um, historical conjuncture that um, have uh, artists have responded to with new forms. And in a way, we are, we keep on saying, you know, late, cap, late capital, neo, neo, whatever, but like we are still kind of seeing the end of that approach to nature. I mean, the end, I mean, I don't want to be apocalyptic, but somehow we are seeing that um, having obviously origin. Uh, or somehow coming to the fore and coming into art more specifically in the 1890s or, or so through world fairs and um, uh, breaking the boundary between body and uh, artwork, technology, those kind of, that triangulation is what I think is still with us. So. Can I add just very, very briefly to those two excellent answers, I think, to the question that one, I think um, when, when a ghost haunts you, like modernism haunts us, you can either exercise it or you can kind of seek to understand it better. I think, I think the fact of its haunting is part of what makes it interest and we'll keep turning it over in our hands and we'll keep finding out new things. I think that's sort of an imperative. But also those those two excellent answers by Jay and Matilde really flag up that modernism has has a kind of dual meaning. Sometimes it is art made under the conditions of modernity. Sometimes it's a very specific American term for a whole way of conceptualizing 
the the self in relation to the state and uh, and, and a, a way of, of thinking and, um, and and creating identity and uh, and that latter definition is um, a big object to study for me that I think really grew out of the immediate post-war era and and it grew out of a kind of society that fundamentally in a way we're still living in um, and in terms of a long historical moment a, a liberal society um, a capital L liberal society where we are more individuals than we are collectives if you see what I mean um, so I think it's still still sort of imperative that we keep turning over the meanings of modernism All right, thank you all. We are going a couple minutes over because of our technical issues. So um, I think we'll just have a few more questions that are coming through um, and we will still have time um, for a break before the three o'clock artist talk. So this is a question for John from Pepe Carmel. Um, he writes, the idea of sculptural installation as an interactive environment goes back at least to Alan Capro and is revived in 1971 by Robert Morris at the Tate. How does the interactive quality of the Smokehouse Associates sculptures differ from that of these installations by white artists? Yeah, great question, Pepe, um, and good to see you on, on, on Zoom earlier. Um, for me, I guess it's the sighting, you know, I mentioned sort of Walter Benjamin's ideas of distraction and the idea of these sculptures were to be sort of discovered or walked past, you know, in these abandoned lots, um, you know, or once abandoned lots and or recently abandoned lots in Harlem. And that nature of sort of artwork that our, our experience as not necessarily artworks is vital to that sort of um, vital to their to their, you know, potential transform tra transformative power. And so I guess for me, it's about the sighting of, you know, the of Morris's show and, you know, in a, in a museum space, once you cross that threshold, you are, you know, a, you're kind of taking a political stance in a way, you're going to a museum and like these, uh, you know, these, the, the inhabitants, you know, who are walking by these sculptures, these paintings, and I guess the, uh, the Smokehouse Associates themselves, like William T. Williams, I think it was, I think it was William T. Williams said that, Never, you know, one time he saw people dancing in front of the wall paintings, children dancing, like, you know, the paintings just made them want to dance or saw children playing on their sculptures. And like, this was what, you know, what they wanted to, to achieve this sort of symbolic, sort of transform, transform, transformational experience that wasn't, you know, wasn't predicated upon them being a work of art. You know, they, they were in dialogue with works of art, clearly with, 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 with interactive sculpture, but I think that setting of them in, in an urban area that wasn't marked as a museum was, you know, was very was was the primary difference. Thank you for that. And another question coming from Pepe for Jonathan actually seems somewhat related. Um, and he writes in 1989, I heard Burton's lecture for the Brancusi show. He recounted asking Philip Johnson if modernist if modern furniture was comfortable. Johnson supposedly replied, quote, it's comfortable if I enjoy looking at it. What role does comfort or more broadly pleasure play in Burton's own work? And is it related to his take on Brancusi? That's a great question and a great quote. Um, thank you, Pepe. Yeah, I think I have only been to, I, I put up those pictures of the, the Equitable Center. I've only been and seen Burton's work there, where you have those low tables sort of set in a, um, with stools around, and also the the sort of six parts seating, is it called, the, in the um, sculpture garden, uh, the National, Ga National Gallery of Art. And they look um, severe, obviously, tend to be made out of granite, stone. Um, but I think, I think for Burton, by the time he is mostly producing furniture sculpture in the 80s. He's, de he's designing them in a way that um, intends A, to be comfortable, and B, to be inclusive and welcoming, and C, to very frequently stimulate discussion and exchange. Um, invariably, you, you don't see those sculptures being used as seating often, or certainly I haven't. I haven't seen them when there's you know, um, in, in a public square where they're being sort of like 
actively being used by the public. So I, I, I don't know how well they facilitate that. And again, the sort of institutional conditions under which they, they are now kind of impede things. But my, my, my understanding is that as part of his post-minimalist concern for um, really serving a, a multiplicity of viewers, um, comfort was an important condition of, of his production. Thank you. We are just about at wrap up time, but I believe Jonathan, you have a question that you'd like to pose. So let me turn. It, it's like, like I, I want to make sure people have enough time and everything. And it's okay. something I can talk to Jay about later. Okay, I imagine lots of conversations will happen yeah. offline. Um, I want to thank the three of you for those really um, just brilliant, uh, thought-provoking papers, and thank the YCBA uh, for um, sharing this day or inviting us to share in this day. And so, at three o'clock, please um, be back for the artist talk. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.